Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to session three of the LA County Sheriff Civilian Oversight Commission special hearings on deputy gangs. We're going to uh, begin in a minute. I just uh, want to um, remind everyone that uh, Loyola has asked that if we could all wear masks um, inside unless uh, uh, we're speaking. So for, for our advocates, of course, you can take off the mask when you're questioning and witnesses can uh, proceed however they want. They can testify in a mask or they can take off their mask. And uh, there are restrooms in the lobby immediately to your left. So if you go out the double doors, there are uh, restrooms available as well as in the Burns building. Uh, if you go outside the yellow building, double doors, you can go through and there are large uh, uh, bathrooms as well. Um, with that said, I think we just should call the roll. Commissioner Bonner. Commissioner Diggins. Here. Commissioner Cooper. Here. Commissioner Garcia. Here. Commissioner Harris. Here. Vice Chair Hicks. Commissioner Rubin. Yes, here. Chair Kennedy. Here. All right. Uh, I think we're going to begin. I assume uh, uh, Rob Bonner will be joining us shortly. And um, uh, the first item on the agenda are reports and updates uh, from myself uh, and our special counselor, counsel, Bert Dykesler. Uh, I don't have any report because the uh, hearing itself is, is our report. But Bert, um, you want to start us off? Thank you. Um, good morning, commissioners. I want to start as uh, we've started the last two sessions with what I'll describe as a procedural report. I'll tell you who uh, who we expect will testify and the circumstances of their testimony, who we have subpoenaed to testify, who told us they will not attend, um, and uh, perhaps some of the reasons why. Um, our witnesses today will be uh, former Chief Burson, uh, who will testify in person. Um, our uh, second witness will be former uh, Captain Del Meese. Uh, we are told by his lawyer that uh, he is recovering from COVID, and so as an accommodation, we have agreed that he can testify by WebEx. Um, and our third witness of the day will be Chief Tardy, whom I told could come at 10 o'clock so that she wouldn't have to uh, spend time that she could otherwise work on the people's business. Um, two witnesses who have been subpoenaed are not coming, we've learned, as of yesterday. Uh, the first uh, uh, witness is the sheriff. The sheriff's lawyer yesterday sent a uh, brief note explaining three reasons why the sheriff would not be attending notwithstanding the fact that he's received a subpoena. The first is a contention that I have a conflict and that I am adverse to the um, sheriff. The basis of that is that uh, a partner at my law firm is the, uh, has been appointed by the county council to oversee compliance with the um, uh, ROSAS uh, stipulation that um, has been going on for more than a decade. The sheriff is named nominally in that case. As each sheriff over the last decade has come and gone, that person's name is substituted. I'm uh, uh, walled from that case, notwithstanding the fact that it's not, uh, has, it has nothing to do with any of this. But I am told that uh, Mr. Dugdale, who is the lawyer involved, who had been the chief of the criminal division of the United States Attorney's Office for something like 19 years, has never spoken with the sheriff, period, full stop, end of story. Um, and secondly, that um, 
This is, of course, not as a, this is not an adversary proceeding. Indeed, it is my understanding that uh, the sheriff is eager to have us get to the bottom of all of these issues because of his uh, professed commitment to transparency. So for that reason, those are um, unsubstantial and no basis to not attend. Um, the second uh, reason offered was that the work of this commission is not in furtherance of the commission's purpose, um, which I believe is uh, inconsistent with what we've been trying to accomplish in our investigation and in our public presentations. And uh, finally, um, the sheriff fears for his security because uh, he has been informed that members of the public have attended and wear shirts or jackets that say, um, F the sheriff. Um, the sheriff fears for his security on the Loyola Law School campus. That's what we've been told by his uh, attorney, personal lawyer. The second witness who's not going to uh, be appearing today is the under sheriff uh, Murakami, and uh, <laughs> he uh, has provided to, uh, to his, his photograph that I thought would be helpful. I'm, I'm told that's a Spartan shirt. Um, we are told by a uh, purported physician that while uh, the undersheriff is able to uh, perform his regular sheriff's duties, that uh, the stress of responding to a subpoena and testifying before the uh, commission would be too stressful and create an adverse health risk for him. And so he, uh, on that basis, is uh, not going to come at the appropriate time. We're going to ask the commission for uh, the power to ask the county council to bring motions to compel uh, the testimony uh, and the appearance of both the sheriff um, and the under sheriff. Uh, and there's a third issue which I feel compelled to bring to the attention of the commission now, uh, which has arisen in the last 36 hours. We have learned that a um, potential uh, witness who is a member of the sheriff's department has uh, received an order to appear uh, with his computer uh, at the sheriff's uh, department and to uh, sign a non-disclosure agreement with regard to an investigation that he has uh, undertaken that relates directly to the work that we are doing here. Um, at least out of an abundance of caution, we're going to ask the commission to um, empower us through the ad hoc committee to issue a subpoena to require that uh, all documents that refer, reflect, or relate in any way to the investigation pertaining to Kennedy Hall be preserved inviolate so that uh, we don't have a problem of, for example, investigator notes um, disappearing uh, or otherwise being unavailable. And so I'll do that, I guess, at the, at the conclusion of all of this. So that's my uh, procedural report. Uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to address them now or hold them in abeyance. Otherwise, I'm prepared to call our first witness. I think in light of the fact that we do not have the presence of the sheriff, Sheriff Villanueva, or the presence of uh, Under Sheriff Murakami, and pursuant to the bound and lawful subpoena of this body, the Civilian Oversight Commission, I would move that uh, the, uh, that we ask request county council to forthwith file appropriate motions uh, with uh, the LA County Superior Court to compel the testimony, the appearance and testimony under oath of both of those individuals uh, who, who are essential to the investigation of the Civilian Oversight Commission's uh, inquiry into deputy cliques, gangs, so, and exclusionary subgroups. Um, I must also say that I'm, I'm astonished that Under Sheriff Murakami is able to perform the duties of Under Sheriff, but he's unable to appear and testify for an hour or so before our commission and answer questions with respect to um, a matter that uh, 
a very serious matter impacting the sheriff's department, which are the existence of deputy cliques, gangs, or, and or exclusionary subgroups. Um, the, uh, you know, one of the fundamental uh, job duties of uh, every deputy sheriff, including the undersheriff, is the ability to appear and testify in court and at hearings. And uh, if he's not able to appear and testify, I suggest that he forthwith resign, take medical leave without pay, or some other appropriate actions, because he has no he has no business being the under sheriff uh, for the LA County Sheriff's Department if he can't appear and testify before an oversight commission that is set up to provide oversight of the Sheriff's Department. Um, but I, I, anyway, in any event, I would make those those motions and also move, as I think we did last time, that the uh, County Council use every available procedure of the LA County Superior Court to expedite those motions to compel uh, the testimony of Sheriff Villanueva and Under Sheriff Murakami. Um, I'd second um, those motions or that motion for the subpoenas. And I also note regarding the sheriff in particular that um, this will be the third or the fourth time that he's been served with subpoenas, that he has refused um, to appear. And my question is, how many more times do we have to deal with uh, a sheriff who refuses to abide by a lawful subpoena? Um, I'm not looking for an answer, but I urge county council um, to end this gamesmanship on the part of the sheriff. Point of fact, it is the fifth time <clears throat> Sheriff Villanueva has refused to comply with the subpoena of this committee. The first time he refused, he ultimately volunteered to appear, not pursuant to the subpoena, but he did voluntarily appear when the uh, LA County Superior Court judge, Judge Fuji, was on the cusp of holding in contempt for its failure to appear. He then voluntarily appeared. Unfortunately, we did not get a ruling in that case. Uh, that's another issue. But it's the fifth time he has refused to appear pursuant to a, a, a lawful subpoena of the Oversight Commi uh, Committee. Uh, uh, and and it's, 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 uh, it's intolerable. Before um, you call a vote, I do have one additional fact that I should have mentioned before with regard to this specific subpoena to the, uh, to the sheriff. Uh, the Commission, of course, will recall that on June the 10th at our last public hearing, uh, it was announced that we were going to have that uh, subpoena issued. On June 13th, uh, Lieutenant O'Connell, uh, who is acting as the intermediary between uh, the commission and the sheriff, uh, agreed to accept electronic service of the subpoena for the sheriff, uh, which was promptly um, uh, delivered on the 15th of June. Um, Lieutenant O'Donnell said that the sheriff's schedule was filling up and he wouldn't be available on the 1st of July. There was no mention made of the conflict, the fact that it was not in furtherance of a commission purpose or his fear for the public who wore uh, F the sheriff um, shirts and jackets. Nor was that excuse even mentioned in the list of reasons uh, given by his, uh, more recently by uh, the um, private lawyer that's representing uh, the sheriff. I'm wondering, uh, before we proceed with the first witness, though, but there was another uh, request that our special counsel made, and that is a motion to uh, essentially uh, empower the, the, for the commission to empower the issuance of a subpoena for any and all documents related to mm -hmm. the investigation of the Kennedy Hall incident. And uh, I'm prepared to make that motion now with any fine tuning or tweaking somebody wants to make to it. I think, I think it's uh, appropriate that we uh, make sure that we uh, preserve those documents <coughs> as part of our investigation, ultimately potentially subpoena and having those documents before us. I'll second that. 
Shall we take a vote? So we have three motions. We. I thought we have two. Well, okay, one motion to compel both the the uh, Murakami and uh, Sheriff Villanueva. Okay, I see that as three motions, but but I'm I might be too metaphysical about it. <laughs> uh, let me ask um, Brian, our executive director. Do we have to have uh, public comment, or can we vote? We do have to have public comment if there is any. We don't have anybody who signed up for public comment for this specific item. We have one for general public comment. But if there's anyone that would like to speak, uh, please I'll raise your hand regarding this uh, vote, this motion. Oh, no, I have nothing on that. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, why don't we take a vote? Commissioner Bonner? Aye. As to all three. Okay. Commissioner Cooper? Aye. Commissioner Garcia? Aye. Commissioner Giggins? Aye. Commissioner Harris? Aye. Chair Kennedy? Yes, as to all motions. And Commissioner Rubin? Yes. Ms. Karen? We, uh, we interrupted you, Mr. Dixler. Well, uh, the other thing I wanted to do before I called our first witness um, is to introduce the other counsel who will be appearing today and who worked um, so diligently with us uh, to try to organize uh, testimony and, and the like. And so from left to right, um, Sarah Moses of the Manat firm, Naoon Reem of the Manat firm, Anthony Pacheco of the Vetter Price firm, and I see that uh, Bill Foreman uh, masked with the uh, red, white, and blue tie um, from the Winston and Strawn firm who will be examining a witness as well today. Thank you. We, uh, we really appreciate all the lawyers who have volunteered their time and worked so hard to uh, <clears throat> bring out all the evidence um, of deputy gangs within the department as the sh sheriff has requested. Um, we do. So, with the commission's permission, I'd ask um, that we call uh, Matthew Burson as our next witness. I'm told he's in the witness room, and if you'd like, I'll go get him. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Burson. Could you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Burson, uh, good morning. Would you please uh, state your full name and spell your last name for the record? My name is Matthew Jerome Burson, B-U-R-S-O-N. And, sir, are you currently an employee of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department? No, I'm not. Well, when did your service to the department end, sir? Uh, March 31st, 2022. At the time of your retirement, what position did you hold? Division chief. Would you share with the commission a bit about the path of your career from your graduation from the academy until your retirement as a chief? I graduated from the academy, the LA County Sheriff's Academy in 1989. And from that point, I worked the Civil Brand Institute for Women Custody Division from 89 to 1995. From 1995 to 1998, I worked patrol as a patrol deputy at Carson and Industry Stations. <clears throat> from 1998 to 2000, I worked the gang enforcement team for Operation Safety Bureau. From 2000, to 2006, I work Operation Safety Bureau as a detective and also an FBI. Uh, I work with the FBI on a task force. I was a task force officer and also in homicide as a uh, homicide uh, task force officer. 
In 2006, I promoted to the rank of sergeant, January 2006. Um, worked patrol at Lenox Station for approximately 10 months. Went back to Operation Safety Bureau as a uh, sergeant, team sergeant. Worked there until 20, excuse me, 2018. I'm sorry, 20, 2008. Then I went to the sheriff's office and I was the executive aide for Sheriff Lee Baca from 2008 to 2010. 2010, I promoted, um, say February 2010, I promoted to the rank of lieutenant, went to Lenox Station, worked there until 2012. Then I went to Homicide Bureau as a homicide team lieutenant, 2012 to 2013. And then from 2013, I went to the d division, um, excuse me, detective division for the, uh, and I was the executive aide for the division chief of detective division. And worked there until 2015. In 2015, I promoted to the rank of captain. Again, going back to Operation Safe Streets Bureau Worked there until uh, say June of 2015 to April of 2018. And then in April of 2018, I went to the Internal Criminal Investigations Bureau as a captain from 2018 of April till December of 2018, where I was promoted to Division Chief for Professional Standards Division and maintained that position until my re until I left the department in February of 2021. I left on a medical leave and then uh, March of 22, that was my last uh, day on the department. Well, sir, after all of that work, you richly deserve uh, to, uh, to have a retirement. Let me ask you, um, were you ever a commander? No, sir. Um, is it usual for a person to be elevated from captain to division chief without being a commander? Uh, generally, you would follow the path of captain, commander, and chief. Uh, who is the sheriff who elevated you from uh, from captain to commander? That is the current chair, Sheriff Villanueva. Uh, did you know the sheriff prior to your appointment as a division chief? No, I did not. What about the under sheriff uh, Murakami? Did you know him? Yes, I did. And about how long did you know the under sheriff Murakami? For approximately 30 years. Okay. Um, do you know whether he has a tattoo as a member of a deputy clique? I uh, understand he has a tattoo of a caveman on his ankle. Yes. And uh, the cavemen were a deputy clique as you understood it? Yes. Uh, let me turn your attention, if I can, to your duties at ICIB. Could you briefly outline for the commission your duties at ICIB in 2018 prior to your promotion to division chief? The duties of ICIB is to investigate criminal activity caused uh, or committed by department employees. Was one of the matters you were overseeing the investigation of the beating at Kennedy Hall? Yes. Um, at the beginning of your work on the Kennedy Hall investigation, did you participate in a meeting with Chief Gooden on the subject of that investigation? Yes, I did. And do you recall anybody else who attended that meeting with you and the Chief Gooden? I believe it was uh, Commander Curtis Jensen and Constitutional Police and Advisor Diana Turan. Um, did you receive direction from Chief Gooden to investigate the Kennedy Hall incident as a potential criminal matter? Yes. And do you recall what factors were identified as the reason it should be treated uh, as a criminal rather than a policy violation? Well, def definitely it was the severity of the injuries that the uh, deputies uh, sustained and also to get to the bottom of the click uh, alleged click aspect of what was occurring at that uh, off training party. Um, in that meeting with the chief uh, Gooden and uh, Commander Jensen and uh, the constitutional policing um, uh, lawyer, um, 
what do you recall being said on the subject matter of needing to get to the bottom of deputy cliques or gang involvement? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, what do you remember being said on the subject of needing to uh, investigate or talk about uh, deputy cliques? In that meeting? Yes. So, oh, okay. No, uh, again, it was the uh, severity of the beatings. Um, it was, uh, it was a, a variety of, of factors. Uh, just the, the nature of that station, um, the history of that station and some of the other incidents that were potentially occurred at that station. Do you recall whether at that meeting with the Chief Gooden, uh, Commander Jensen and uh, um, Lawyer Terran that uh, there was a discussion of the possibility that the facts that were then known would show concrete evidence of deputy gangs? Well, we didn't call them gangs at the time. It was clicks. Okay, yeah. uh, same concept. Um, uh, let's make clear then what you mean by a deputy click as you use that term in 2018, as you met with uh, this uh, group of uh, senior executives of the department. What was a click as you use that term? Well, I mean, a, a click was just a group of deputies who had similar tattoos and um, basically were in charge of the station, uh, in charge of other deputies, uh, just had their own, their own little fiefdom, we'll say. Was, was Jefferson Chow the lead investigation, investigator of the Kennedy Hall meeting? Yes. And did you regard him as a competent investigator? Yes. Um, prior to the sheriff's election of 2018, um, did you believe the Kennedy Hall incident was properly viewed as a criminal investigation? Yes. Let me ask you a bit, drawing on that long experience, when you were at homicide in uh, ICIB, was one of the things that was routinely sought to be determined by investigators the motive for alleged wrongdoing? Absolutely, yes. And, and why is discovering the motive for a crime important for a criminal investigator? Well, I mean, that's that's the whole genesis of the crime. You need to uh, determine why that crime occurred and who was involved. Is uh, the discovery of the motive for a crime consistent with um, professional police practices? Yes. And would it have been important, for example, for you to determine whether the Kennedy Hall incident was just a drunken brawl or an event that involved a clique enforcing its power over other deputies. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Would it, why, if it, if it was, why would it matter to you whether you were investigating a drunken brawl or a power uh, assertion by a group uh, click? Well, I mean, you, you want to get to the root of, of what occurred. Um, when you were at OSS, which you've described as Operation Safe Streets, is that, uh, was its principal focus criminal gangs? Yes. And by criminal gangs, I mean uh, street gangs. Is that, that what you understood? Yes, uh, did the operation um, of um, your work at OSS gain you familiarity with how gangs operated? Yes. Would it be fair to say that gangs operated with a shot caller? Yes, that's correct. And, and what is a shot caller as that term is used in, uh, in criminal gangs? Shot caller is generally the individual that's in charge of the gang, that's given direction to the gang. Uh, a moment ago, you testified about um, how in the uh, East L.A. station where the Kennedy Hall incident occurred, there was a group of deputies that appeared to be running it for their own benefit or words to that effect. Do I remember correctly? Yes. Um, uh, would that be in the nature of there being a shot caller uh, at the East L.A. station at the time? Uh, is, a, is a sheriff station run by a shot caller rather than a captain? Uh, a violation of fundamental principles of professional policing? No. A shot caller should not run a station, no. That's... And, and why, why is it that a shot caller shouldn't run a station, uh, whereas perhaps a captain should? No, a captain should run a station, not a shot caller. Um, as the investigation of the Kennedy Hall beating began, did you receive a word that Max Huntsman of the OIG wanted to make sure the investigation of Kennedy Hall included understanding the role of uh, subgroups, cliques, or deputy gangs? Yes. And how did that uh, 
uh, requirement come to your attention? Uh, we met with Mr. Hustman uh, in person, with myself, um, my commander at the time, Steve Gross, the IAV captain uh, was also in attendance. Uh, when you began your work uh, on this uh, East LA uh, beating investigation, uh, did you know the specific name of the banditos? Uh, no, I didn't. Were you aware, nevertheless, of the history of the East LA station? I was. Yes. And uh, just tell us a little bit about what you knew about that and whether it was a location for known problem deputies. Well, I recall there was a lawsuit uh, some years back involving one of the trainees there who had mentioned that she had to do certain things to get off training. And um, it was a direct re reference to the banditos at the station. Uh, did you meet with a Lieutenant Chevalier to discuss whether a proper investigation would include determining uh, whether there were deputy gangs or cliques as a motive for the Kennedy Hall beatdown? Yes. Um, and uh, did you have any question in your mind that a proper investigation of Kennedy Hall would have required an investigation into the involvement, if any, of a deputy clique or gang? No. Let me uh, ask you to take a look at what has been previously marked as exhibit numbered four, which we've established is the log of the investigator, um, investigator Chow. And perhaps we can put that up. Um, and I'd like to direct your attention to the entry of November 9th, 2018. Page before, I guess. Ah. 1530. Do you see that uh, entry? Yes. Sir. And does uh, the entry on 11 9 2018 on exhibit four accurately reflect your understanding of what was required by OIG to ensure that the investigation was thorough? Yes. Would you, just for the record, read into the record uh, what is uh, uh, contained there, starting with the word also? Also, Lieutenant Chevalier advised me OIG wanted additional questions about subgroup subcultures at East LA. Captain Burson confirmed additional questions need to be asked. And was the confirmation by you that additional questions needed to be asked a function of the conversations you had had with uh, Chief Gooden, Commander Jensen, uh, yes. among others, as well as drawing upon your long experience as uh, an investigator in homicide and ICIB and Operation Safe Streets? Yes. Uh, all of the decisions you made were a product of your lengthy and distinguished career in the, in the uh, Sheriff's Office. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Um, and at the time, uh, November 9th, 2018, when that instruction was given by you, who was the sheriff of Los Angeles County? Jim McDonald. Um, now, let me turn your attention to November. Me, counsel, do yes. we have a, an approximate date of that entry? I, I'm trying to read it here, and I'm at an angle. It's 11-9-18 at 1530 hours. 11-9-18. Thank you. November 9th, uh, yes. 2018. Thank you. Yes. Um, did you, after the 9th of uh, November, receive a phone call from uh, Captain Larry Delmise? Yes. Let me ask you uh, to look at the entry for 11 27, 2018. And while we scroll there, who was uh, Captain Larry Del Meese at the time of this call in November of 2018? Uh, captain Del Meese was a captain of the Court Services Division, but he was also on, uh, for what I understood, uh, incoming Sheriff Villanueva's transition team. Um, was he as a captain in the paramilitary structure of the LA Sheriff's Department superior to you? No, he was equal. Was he in a position to, uh, being in court services, in a position to give you direction uh, at uh, on his own, um, given your work in ICIB? 
No. Um, as best you can recall, uh, what did Captain Del Meese say to you on the 27th of November? Uh, Captain Del Meese called me on behalf of the sheriff, the incoming sheriff, Alex Villanueva, and told me to hold off on any questioning about the investigation, including the banditos, until I talked to him, um, until I talked to the sheriff when he would come into office. As of November 27th, 2018, was Alex Villanueva the sheriff of Los Angeles County? No. Uh, as of November 27th, 2018, who was the sheriff of Los Angeles County? Jim McDonald. Um, did you believe that Captain Del Meese was speaking for himself or was speaking on behalf of the uh, incoming but not yet sheriff of Villanueva? He was definitely speaking on behalf of Alex Villanueva. And, and what was it that he said that caused you to believe that? He said uh, specifically that, uh, hey, uh, I talked to the sheriff and the sheriff or Alex Villanueva wants you to hold off on any questioning until you talk to me, until I talk to the sheriff uh, when he comes in the office. And, um, why did you care about what uh, Captain Del Meese told you uh, on that occasion? Why did it matter to you as a member of the Sheriff's Department? Well, he was uh, working on the incoming Sheriff's Transition Team, and so he had a direct line to the Sheriff of the incoming Sheriff. Now let's go to the entry of 1127. And uh, for the record, could you read that entry, uh, 1127, 1300 hours? Canceled interviews due to captain slash chief person. He wanted, and I don't know if uh, the camera's blocking the rest of the statement. Yeah. He, he wanted to make sure. Oh, he wanted to make sure. I did not have to ask questions about subcultures. Let's have this uh, removed so you can read it. You know, the other thing is, I'm counsel, I wouldn't mind if you just read it into the record because I, I can't read it from this angle. Sure. Uh, I thought we we're, have the, yeah, we're having the witness uh, reader. Why don't we start again now that we've okay. uh, made it clearer for you? It's the entry of November 27th, 2018 at 1300 hours. Canceled interviews due to captain slash chief person. He wanted to make sure I did not have to ask questions about subculture groups at East LA Station. Worked on, no, well, worked and, on another case. And so uh, that entry of November 27th, uh, and I will get to the captain chief point uh, shortly, but that entry of November 27th, 2018, does that accurately reflect the instruction that you gave to Investigator Chow yes. on that occasion? And does it accurately reflect the instruction you received from Captain Del Meese, uh, which was given to you uh, on behalf of the incoming but not yet Sheriff of Villanueva? Yes. Um, let, me, uh, let me pause um, on the entry describing you as Captain slash Chief as of 1127. As of 1127, had you been promoted? No. As of 1127, who was the chief of professional standards, the, the position that you were ultimately appointed to? Alicia Alt. Um, and as of November 27th, did you believe that Chief Alt and Mr. Del Meese had uh, some issue or dispute regarding a personnel issue? Yes. And what was your understanding about what that dispute pertained to? Uh, what I understand is Captain Del Meese called uh, Chief Alt in uh, telling her that she needed to rehire uh, Carl Mandonia, who was a uh, discharge employee. And again, that was a conversation which occurred prior to 1127, as far as you know, but reflected Captain Del Meese um, issuing directions on behalf of the incoming but not yet sheriff. Is that how you understood the chronology? Yes. And as of 1127, did you have a belief that Chief Alt was likely to be replaced as chief? I'm, I'm sorry, say Yes, as of November 27th, did you believe that, the, that Chief Alt was likely to be replaced in her position? Uh, I had no idea. Was there a rumor about somebody who might be taking that position? Uh, yes, 
and, and, and what was the rumor that you heard in or about that time? Uh, at that time, or shortly thereafter that, it was uh, Lieutenant Rich Weston um, was rumored to, uh, he was gonna be the Chief of Professional Standards Division. And, and do you know whether um, uh, Lieutenant Weston had any relationship with Mr. Del Meese or the sheriff or whatever the basis was for, their, for the rumor going around the department that he might get that position? Uh, I didn't know the relationship at the time. Um, did he get the promotion? Uh, no, he did not. Okay, we'll come back to, uh, to the circumstances of your promotion in a moment, but uh, let's return to the entry of 1127. Um, am I um, clear that the instruction to pause, that is to uh, not ask questions about subculture groups at East LA Station, was your uh, direct instruction uh, from Mr. Del Meese, Captain Del Meese, yes. um, to you, which you just conveyed to, uh, to Deputy Chow? Yes. Um, given your background at uh, uh, OSS and ICB and homicide, um, did you understand that in ordering a pause into any subgroup um, role in the, in the beating might affect the ability to determine the motive um, for that uh, act? Yes. Um, if it was a beating administered by a subgroup as a result of a plan or a display of authority, uh, that would have been something that would be important for an investigator to be able to uh, know in assessing what would be proper in that case? Yes. Um, did the order to pause uh, looking into the motive for a crime seem odd to you? Very, yes. Um, did it seem odd to you that the order to pause an investigation into the motive for a crime was coming at the direction of a person who was not yet the sheriff of Los Angeles County? Yes. Um, 30 years of service as a uh, in the sheriff's department, can you think of another occasion in which uh, you were told not to investigate the motive for a crime? <laughs> Never. Um, did you become aware that Alex Villanueva regarded East LA as his uh, home station? That's very obvious, yes. Um, do you remember when Alex Villanueva got sworn in as the sheriff? Uh, December 3rd, 2018. And when he was sworn in as the sheriff, did you observe whether he had singled out any group for special attention? <laughs> yes. And, and, and would you share with the commission what you observed on December the 3rd of 2018 when Sheriff Vinueva was sworn in? Yes, a number of us um, executives, Captain and above, attended the uh, inauguration of uh, Mr. Vinueva being sworn at East LA College. and. We noticed that there was a section towards the front that was roped off a large section. And prior to the inauguration uh, commencing, uh, we noticed East LA station deputies marching in and sitting in those specific seats. And so as of December 3rd, 2018, when these East LA deputies marched in, the uh, investigation into the conduct of certain of those deputies at Kennedy Hall had been paused. Is that true? Yes. Um, knowing that there had been this investigation, that it had been paused, and seeing what looks like uh, special attention, uh, what was your reaction to that, uh, to that moment when the East LA uh, deputies marched into the inauguration of the new sheriff? I thought it was extremely odd and inappropriate. Uh, and why is that? Uh, well, you don't single out, you're the sheriff of the entire county. You don't single out one station as your favorite. Um, after the sheriff was sworn in, did you attend a staff meeting with the new sheriff and other ranking officers? On uh, that day or? Uh, after point? that, some, sometime after the third. On uh, December 6th. And would you, December 6th or December 5th, recall? December, oh, I'm sorry, December 5th. Okay, yes. and, and on December 5th, would you describe the, uh, the meeting that you attended? This was a meeting at Star Center where we were 
uh, we being uh, lieutenant and above, all the ranks of lieutenant and above, attended a meeting uh, with the new sheriff and uh, he spoke to us about leadership and then we all had to remove our insignias from our collars, which uh, identified our ranks. And after uh, you had uh, removed your insignias, what was the next thing that uh, you had to do um, um, at this uh, meeting? Uh, we were all subsequently broken up into groups and had to write uh, resumes um, according to our careers. Um, how did the that meeting strike you? Very odd. Um, after the meeting in which you were asked to uh, remove your insignias uh, and the insignias of other ranking officers, um, did you speak with Captain Del Mise again? I did the following day. And uh, on December the 6th, was that? Yes. And by the time you had spoken to uh, Captain Del Mise, had he been promoted? He was now the uh, sheriff being away was chief of staff. And was he still a captain or he, did he receive a promotion as well? He promoted to chief of staff. Yes. I see. So he, he, he went from a captain to a chief of staff. Yes. From December 3rd to December the 5th, I guess. Yes. Okay. And um, would you uh, tell me what happened on December 6th in your conversation with Captain Del Mies? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Chief of Staff Del Mies. I was uh, at a Christmas party with uh, Internal Criminal Investigation Bureau, and I received a call from Chief of Staff uh, Del Mies to report to the Sheriff's Office. And uh, did you do so? Yes. And when did you do so? Um, in the afternoon of December 6th. And uh, would you describe the meeting? Uh, well, I went uh, to the sheriff's office, uh, sat down in his office. It, it was a sheriff, uh, chief of staff, Del Meese, and then under Sheriff uh, Ray Leva was in the office. And when you entered the meeting on December the 6th, what was your rank? Uh, Captain. And when you left the meeting on December 6th, what was your rank? Uh, division chief. And again, you skipped over being a commander and went straight to being a chief? Yes. And uh, that was kind of an unusual rocket ship of a promotion, wasn't it? Yes. Um, uh, after your promotion on December 6th, did you again speak with Commander, I'm, so, I'm sorry, chief. chief of Staff Del Mies? Yes. And how soon after you were promoted did uh, Chief of Staff Del Mies uh, call you? Uh, well, I called him on the following day, on December 7th. And uh, on December the 7th, the day after you were promoted, uh, what was the substance of the conversation between you and Del Meese? Uh, the point of my calling um, Chief Del Meese was to ask the sheriff about the investigation that we were told to halt. And what was, uh, what was said by each of you as, in general, as you best recall in that conversation? Well, uh, again, every time Larry talked, it was on behalf of the sheriff, and basically that's how every conversation started. So in this instance, it was on behalf of the sheriff, uh, go ahead and uh, don't look into the bandito aspect of the case or the subgroup aspect of the case, just focus on the alcohol in the fight. Um, did, did the fact that um, you had received this uh, instruction um, lead you to the belief that you were being instructed by the, the chief uh, law enforcement law enforcement officer of Los Angeles County, that is the new sheriff, about how to conduct an investigation? Yes. Let me ask you again to look at Exhibit 4, which, and the entry for December the 7th at 9 a.m. Could you read uh, into the record that entry, please? Receive the go-ahead to start interviewing witnesses for this case. Also, the chief Burson informed me that I did not need to ask about subgroups at East LA. Um, and uh, does that accurately reflect the instruction that you gave to Investigator Chow on December 7th of 2018? Yes. 
And um, let me ask you again, um, because it's a paramilitary structured organization, did you believe you had the power to uh, disobey the order you understood was coming from the sheriff? No, I did not. The uh, word subgroups um, or subculture groups in the entry of December the 7th, did you understand that to include deputy cliques such as the banditos? Yes. Um, and you gave that instruction to Deputy Chow only because uh, Del Meese told you he was speaking on behalf of the sheriff. Is that true? That's correct. Did that strike you as an odd instruction to be given by a new sheriff? Well, uh, again, it, it, it was very odd, but I didn't know at the time who he had spoken with. I didn't know if the sheriff had talked to OIG or county council and collectively made that decision. Nonetheless, I, st I still thought it was odd. Did it ever come to your attention that Max Huntsman and the OIG had told the sheriff, in effect, no need to look into subculture groups or the banditos in East LA? No. Did it ever come to your attention that the county council had suggested to the new sheriff that there was no need to look into subculture groups or the banditos in connection with East LA? No. Uh, while anything was possible at the time, you were ordered and you followed your order. Is that a fair summary of your position, sir? Yes, sir. Um, now, at the time that uh, this December 7th instruction from Chief of Staff Del Meese was given to you on behalf of the sheriff, uh, were you aware that a uh, large number of deputies had already refused to uh, be interviewed in connection with Investigator Chow's investigation? No. When did you learn that fact, if you I, did? I learned that later on. And um, what uh, um, effect would knowing that deputies were refusing to be interviewed have upon you as an investigator to determine the motive of, uh, of a um, crime? Well, I know policy, they're required to cooperate with any criminal investigation. And uh, I just found it striking that they just arbitrarily refused when they should have been disciplined. Did it ever come to your attention that Sheriff Villanueva or um, Chief of Staff Del Meese or anybody else ordered the non-compliant deputies to actually uh, be interviewed? No. As far as you know, um, after this part of the investigation was shut down and the deputies refused to, uh, to testify, uh, or to be interviewed, they were never instructed that they had to as a matter of uh, sheriff departmental policy. Is that fair? Yes. Um, can you think of any reason as a professional investigator with 30 years experience, why on December 7th, 2018, knowing what was known, other than the possibility that somebody had uh, told the sheriff it was unnecessary as just a fact finding matter, is there any reason that one would uh, not want to investigate the uh, subculture involvement in a beatdown uh, deputy on deputy uh, fight? No. Um, at the time you were following orders, did it occur to you that you were somehow being used as part of a cover up? No. Looking back at it now, can you see why an objective observer might conclude that you were part of a cover-up? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you were promoted two grades on December 6th, and by December 7th, you've been instructed to shut down any further investigation of subgroups uh, by the man who had given you the promotion. Do, do I understand that chronology correctly? Yes. And was there a quid pro quo of some sort? Absolutely not. Can you see why an objective observer could think it looks like there was a quid pro quo? Yes. Um, was it unusual for you to follow a direct order from a superior? No. You had a 30 year history of doing so, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, as you reflect back upon that time and that role of your career, do you now feel that you were used as kind of an unknowing dupe to shut down an investigation? I believe I was. Uh, that if the investigation had been pursued properly, that uh, it might have come to a different conclusion? Possibly, yes. 
Are you aware that Deputy Chow has testified that he was surprised that criminal charges weren't filed in the matter? Yes. That he believed criminal charges were warranted? Yes. Do you know that three of the four perpetrators uh, were terminated, but they're seeking reinstatement through the Civil Service Commission? Yes. Um, based upon your 30 years experience, do you have the impression that those are the type uh, deputies that you'd want to uh, be in charge of? Uh, were you back at the LA Sheriff's Department? No, definitely not. Um, we had anonymous, uh, an anonymous witness testify um, who brought out the fact that currently in the East LA station, there were uh, approximately a dozen banditos still there. Uh, as of the time that you retired, did you have the impression that uh, the banditos of East LA had been driven out and were no longer a factor in the East LA station? I, I had no idea. Um, If it had been up to you, would you have uh, ordered Investigator Chow to pursue the subgroup involvement? Yes. Let me change the subject and turn your attention to a statement you publicly made on August the 13th, 2020. Um, and there's a clip that will, I think, focus us on this. Could you play that? My name is Matt Burson. That's M-A-T-T-H-E-W-B-U-R-S-O-N. And I'm the chief of the department's professional standards division. My areas of responsibility include Internal Affairs Bureau, known as IAB, and the Internal Criminal Investigations Bureau. I am here to strongly denounce alleged deputy subgroups and cliques, commonly referred to as deputy gangs. I have more than 30 years of experience in our department, and I had and I take the utmost pride in this in, in this profession. I'm absolutely sick of the allegation of any deputy hiding behind a badge to hurt anyone. As you have heard for decades, LASD has been under intense scrutiny as a result of these groups surfacing in various sheriff stations around the county. Names such as Vikings, Reapers, Regulators, Little Girls, Cowboys, 2,000 and 3,000 Boys, Jump Out Boys, and most recently, candidates and executioners have not only caused great embarrassment and concern to the department, but to the community as well. Currently, IAB is conducting a comprehensive investigation into the existence of the so-called executioners at compensation. However, our intent is to examine the department in its entirety. I want to assure you this administration has taken an aggressive stance in combating this issue and will utilize any resource necessary to identify those individuals involved in adverse behavior with administrative criminal. We have also reached out to the FBI for assistance, knowing that with their dedication and expertise, we will accomplish much more than the previous administration combined as our Gold is transparency. The department has also implemented a new policy prohibiting the participation of subversive groups, which is the first of its kind. On behalf of So, um, thank you. Did the comprehensive uh, investigation of the entire department that you announced on August 13th, 2020 occur? No. Um, after you announced uh, to the public that this uh, comprehensive investigation would occur, what prevented it from occurring? Well, um, we were in the process of uh, waiting for the RAND study to uh, conclude as well. So l let me make sure I understand. After you made this announcement, did somebody tell you to hold off on commencing the uh, investigation? Uh, until the RAND study was completed, or did you decide that on your own? No, we had a meeting uh, in the sheriff's office with various executives and uh, made that determination that we'll wait till the RAND study uh, completes so we can glean information from that study. And was the sheriff present at that meeting? I believe so, yes. And was the under sheriff present at that meeting? Yes. Um, did it ever come to your attention that anybody at the sheriff's office informed the public that the announced comprehensive 
uh, department-wide investigation, in fact, did not occur? I believe no. Um, from August 2020, um, how long did it take before the RAND study was released? The RAND study was released, I believe, in September of 2021. And you were the person who was going to be heading the comprehensive investigation, but uh, you had to take a um, disability um, step down for a period for uh, injuries. Is that true? Yes. And when did you uh, step down for a reason of health? Uh, February of 2021. So uh, from February 2021 through September of 2021, if not you, who would have been in charge of leading the comprehensive investigation of the entire department? Uh, I would have assume it would have been uh, the person replacing me. And who's that? Her name was uh, Kelly Borowski. And did it ever come to your attention that Kelly Borowski had uh, conducted a, a comprehensive investigation of the entire department during the hiatus, um, your, hi your injury hiatus? No. Um, would it be fair to say that uh, well, more than a year passed from the time you made the announcement uh, until the RAND report and the public was never informed that the comprehensive investigation, which you had announced, did not take place? That's correct. Um, other than meeting, well, did you meet with RAND in connection with their uh, uh, investigation or study? Uh, initially, at the uh, beginning of the uh, of their study. And uh, uh, after you met with them at the beginning of the study, did, did they call upon you again for further information? Uh, I might have talked to them once or twice after that. Um, other than the meeting with Rand once or twice, did you have any other involvement in a comprehensive investigation? No, no, sir. Um, and again, specifically the sheriff, did he ever announce that the comprehensive investigation had not been done? Uh, no. Um, do you think a comprehensive investigation of the entire department regarding the involvement of deputy gangs would have been beneficial to the department that you've given 30 years of your life to? Absolutely, yes. And, and why is that? Well, I mean, obviously there's something going on there. And uh, this isn't new, obviously. This is something that's been occurring for more than 50 years. But every remedy that we've tried at this point has failed, obviously, if we're still talking about this or having this problem and maligning community trust, something needs to change. Let me, uh, yesterday when we spoke, um, I asked you kind of a personal question. And uh, I think the, the commission would benefit from hearing your answer. I asked you, why did you want to become a member of the sheriff's department? Uh, more than 30 years ago. Would you share that sensation of uh, making that decision with this commission? Okay. Well, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles during a time when drugs, violence, and gang activity were part of my environment. At the age of 12, I was a victim of a drive-by shooting because I was walking home at night. Fortunately, I wasn't hit. LAPD 77 division encounters and abuses were normal because everyone was seen as a gang member or a violent threat. I didn't know at the time to be more afraid of the police or the gang members in the community. It was definitely a time of confusion where you couldn't tell the good guy from the bad. But that question was clearly answered for me on January 3rd, 1979 with the tragic murder of Eula May Love mm -hmm. at the hands of two LAPD officers just blocks away. Miss Love, whose grandchildren would ultimately become my nieces and nephew, mm -hmm. was an apparent knife-wielding threat to these officers who shot her approximately 12 times at close range, killing her instantly. And of course, no charges were brought against them. Now it was clear to me who the bad guys were and my disdain for law enforcement only grew. Through my latter years as a teen, the stories of abuse were becoming more obvious and frequent, causing a gap between law enforcement 
and their respective communities to further expand. Therefore, I made a decision to be part of the solution, not the problem, in hopes of defending those who were considered marginalized. I wanted to ensure that everyone, regardless of race, color, creed, or socioeconomic status were given the equal protection of the law they so rightfully deserved. In 1987, I joined the California Department of Corrections as correctional officer before transitioning to Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department in 1989. I felt the LASD would help me accomplish my goal of serving the people of Los Angeles County, particularly communities of color. During my career, I prided myself on maintaining the highest level of integrity, transparency, and character. Treating those I encountered with dignity and respect, in essence, how I wanted to be treated. In my 35 year law enforcement career, I have never had any significant discipline or questionable encounters where my integrity was in question. I have also considered my actions and decisions to be above reproach and never wavered in doing what was right. In fact, mentoring young black men during my tenure as the vice president elect of the Black Peace Officers Association of Los Angeles County was always one of my proudest moments. I've had many mentors through my professional journey, but none more special than my brother-in-law, then Harvard Law Professor Charles Ogletree. He helped me instill my values as a man of integrity and protector of the defenseless and marginalized. Also, my cousin, retired Colonel, Eddie Stephen Ray of the United States Marine Corps and recipient of the Navy Cross taught me about honor, service, dignity, duty, and being fully committed to serving others. But more importantly, it's my faith and love for God it was the foundation of my life <clears throat> and direction. In closing, I'd like to thank this commission for giving me the opportunity to address you and the subject at hand. My goal here today is to remove any doubt of my actions and reaffirm the character of my good name that I worked so hard to establish. <clears throat> I would further like to commend the hardworking men and women of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, Los Angeles Police Department, and law enforcement community as a whole. Over the years, my myopic view of law enforcement as a teenager significantly changed from disdain to compassion and understanding. This is a very difficult profession filled with adversity. The sacrifices and commitments of the law enforcement community should never go unnoticed. Therefore, let not the actions of a few be a reflection of the many who serve their respective communities with honesty, integrity, dignity, and professionalism. Thank you. My last question, sir. Um, was the department you left in March of 2020 the department you hoped that you would have joined 35 years before? I unfortunately have to say no, because I feel that we lost the community, the people we're supposed to serve and protect. And it's going to take uh, a lot of leadership. It's going to be a lot of growing to regain that trust. I have no further questions. I pass the witness. Thank you. Do you want to give him a couple of minutes? Do you need a couple of minutes before we have other questions? Fine. Okay. Could I ask a few? Yeah, and I have some as well. Um, thank you for being here today, Mr. Burson. Um, I don't think we've seen each other for a couple of years. Um, I think on the screen there, there was a, looked like a press conference of August 13th, 2020, when you announced that there would be a comprehensive investigation of deputy cliques and subgroups within the Sheriff's Department including the executioners and, and others. Uh, wasn't, I'm taking you back in time, but my recollection is the RAND study had already started at that point in time. Am, am I 
Am I right? By the way, my memory may not be correct on this, but I actually remember the RAND st study actually starting before that press conference in which you announced that there would be a comprehensive investigation. What's your recollection of that? No, the RAND study was in progress. Yeah. When, uh, when we used to talk about it in our, remember our ad hoc meetings yes. that we had, yeah. um, I thought I mentioned that in one of our ad hoc meetings that we were waiting for the RAND study yeah, to, yeah. to complete. Well, that I don't remember. Here's what I remember and I want to ask you about from the ad hoc. This, were, this is the Oversight Commission's ad hoc committee on deputy clicks that uh, Commissioner Rubin chairs. I'm on it. Uh, Commissioner Harris was on it. I recall a meeting very vividly, uh, Mr. Burson, in which you stated flat out to us at that ad hoc committee that there would be uh, a comprehensive investigation of not just the executioners, but deputy cliques, uh, subgroups, gangs, uh, by whatever nomenclature within the LA Sheriff's Department, that that was going to happen. In fact, you assured us, you assured us that was going to happen. I remember that meeting vividly and I took that away. I do not recall your coming, now I make, by the way, I don't recall everything, but I don't remember your communicating back to us that, oh, well, wait a minute, I told you that, but now well, we've decided to stop, halt the investigation because we're going to wait till the RAND study is completed. I don't remember ever getting that feedback from you, uh, Chief Person, and that's disappointing to me. So tell me, tell me when it was that you communicated that to the ad hoc committee on deputy clicks. Well, I was, uh, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying I'm 100% sure um, on that as well. But uh, I believe that I communicated that to the ad hoc meeting on one of our two meetings, because we only had two meetings. And perhaps I was not at that second meeting. So let me move past that for a moment. But irrespective of that, basically you announced not only, you not only told us, the ad hoc committee on deputy clicks, that this comprehensive investigation was going to move forward. You, you told the public that, and, uh, and then, you go to a meeting at which the sheriff is at, the undersheriff and some others, and they say, oh, wait a minute, it, let's, just, let's just stop the investigation until the RAND study is completed. It looks to me, sir, like the rug was just pulled out from under you. Did you uh, not feel that way? No, I didn't, only because, again, we've looked at this issue for so many years, and I thought we were gonna glean whatever information we got from that study into the investigation. All right, so uh, in any event, I, uh, I just want to say that, uh, you know, you, you've rendered some, you know, some valuable and extraordinary public service uh, in your years as in the Sheriff's Department. But the reality is that uh, the whole, as far as I'm concerned, the whole notion that there was going to be a comprehensive investigation and that it was going to move forward, um, you know, appears to be the joke was on us. Uh, that's a statement. It's not a question, sir, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Bill? Yes. Um, thank you, Chief Person. <clears throat> I um, certainly do remember our previous conversations, um, and you were one of the few members of the Sheriff's Department who agreed to speak with the ad hoc committee, um, and we appreciated your um, candor then, we believed your candor, we believed you. Um, and um, your willingness to work with us and to understand what, um, what the commission was looking at, that we weren't looking to, um, for a scapegoat, we were looking for answers. Um, to help the department and help the community. And we were grateful that you had agreed to talk with us. Um, I distinctly remember you were saying then <clears throat> that you would um, uh, inform the ad hoc committee and the commission of your ultimate findings because um, you believed your responsibilities in your role were um, were significant and important. Um, 
And um, I still today believe that you recognize that. And in fact, even though you were you were here under subpoena, you recognize the important work that this commission is doing. Um, going back to the um, August 13th press conference that um, Mr. Dykesler played the, the video clip. Um, did somebody write those words? Did the press office write of, of the Sheriff's Department write your comments or were they um, comments that you wrote yourself? I wrote myself. And um, at the time that you that you wrote them and before you presented them, um, <clears throat> did um, the under sheriff or the sheriff or anybody on his staff want to know in advance what you were going to say? Yeah, I, I honestly don't recall that. Um, but it was um, it was your belief then um, that you were going to conduct an investigation, even though it was should have been done earlier. But that's another issue, um, and that um, you would make you and the department would make your findings public. Yes. Definitely. And um, did you ever have an opportunity to talk with the sheriff um, about your work, about um, when you could proceed with your investigation, um, going back and sort of piggybacking on the communication you had from Mr. Delmes before the sheriff was um, um installed as the sheriff um you were told to um pause the investigation until you talked to the sheriff so did you ever have an opportunity to talk directly to the sheriff or was it always through mr dummies primarily it was i talked to the sheriff on other occasions but primarily it was through uh chief of staff dummies um, and, um, at the 1st meeting that you had, um, with, um, when you were assigned the role of, of looking into, um, the Kennedy hall and the East LA, you said that there were, um, several people who were, um, present at the meeting including the um, constitutional policing advisor, Diana Turan, yes. correct? Um, did she give you any advice or suggestions about how to conduct uh, the investigation? Honestly, I don't recall. I, I recall Chief Gooden because he was the, he's the primary person that's going to initiate the investigation. And um, at the time when you were heading ICIB, you believed you had the obligation and the responsibility to go where the evidence would lead you, correct? Absolutely, yes. Um, once again, thank you for your candor today. Thank you for your long history. Um, and um, we appreciate your being here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burson, you um, told us that uh, as a longtime member of the department, uh, uh, you observed every remedy that we try has failed. Can you explain to us what remedies you're talking about that the that the sheriff's department has tried to eradicate deputy clicks or deputy Yanks? Well, I'm talking about the Colts Commission, that report and uh, their findings. That was in the 90s, I believe. And uh, then you go to the 3,000, 2,000 boys uh, in, in custody. And, you know, obviously I wasn't directly a part of those incidences, but anytime you would hear about some of those types of instances occurring, you would assume the administration is handling it. Uh, appropriately. Okay. Now, isn't it true 
that the sheriff's department's response to the Colts Commission request to do something about deputy gangs at that time mm -hmm. was to say there are no deputy gangs in the department. Well, I haven't read the full report. No. That was Sheriff Block's response, wasn't it? There, there are none. There are no gangs in the department. No, I don't. I don't recall that. Okay. I, mean, I, I haven't read the full report. I just recall parts of the report. Well, I think the record will show that that was exactly the the reaction. And I guess what I I would like to know is um, when you were told not to investigate the uh, deputy gang affiliation of a group of deputies beating up another group of deputies. Um, did you think that was an order that should be followed? Well, again, I didn't know the true basis of where and why the order was given because it was always rumored that it was just a drunken brawl. And that's what we were told at the inception uh, of the investigation coming from uh, the station acting captain that it was just a drunken brawl. And that was the only thing that was being propagated but it was a drunken brawl. As a long time, well, formerly as a long time member of the department, could you give us any insights into why um, young deputies out of the academy would want to join a deputy gang? I mean, do you know, like, why, why is that appealing to some of the deputies? I have no idea because I never have. Uh, my only objective was to serve the community as we were all sworn to do. When people above you are telling you not to ask about uh, clique or gang affiliation and telling you not to pursue an investigation that you have promised the public you would pursue, um, did you ever question why the management at LASD at the highest level would want to protect the deputy cliques or deputy gangs from being exposed to the public? I guess you would have to ask him that. I'm asking you, like, did you ever wonder why would we want to hide these things? Well, I mean, are you talking about December? Or are you talking about uh, both? Okay. Well, again, in December, of 2018, uh, due to the fact that we're a paramilitary organization, it wasn't my thought to question the sheriff about his decision, not knowing if he had other information, again, from OIG, from county council, from other, some other source. So in that respect, I didn't question it. I just followed orders. In October, excuse me, August of 2020 at my press conference. Uh, I think we were relying more on the RAND study. It was my impression. We were just going to rely more on the RAND study, try to glean information from the RAND study and then move forward from there. Even to try to have a starting point. Is that normal that you're going to not investigate possible crimes? because a think tank is conducting a study of a global issue? Well, we weren't, we were still looking at uh, the Compton executioners, because uh, that was a new thing. And uh, I had also been in contact with the FBI on numerous occasions. So and internally, we were still looking into it. And did you complete any kind of investigation regarding the executioners at the Compton State Station? Did I complete it? No, yeah. I don't know if that investigation was completed. Mm -hmm. I probably, like I said, I was gone several months later. Any other questions, commissioners? Yeah. Patty? Thank you very much, Chief Burson, for being here. I have a couple of questions. Um, did uh, other deputies or captains or other leaders um, ever come to you, even informally, and express concerns about um, these activities of cliques 
uh, either informally or formally, coming you know around the water cooler, having coffee. Or did anybody else express concerns, people that you worked with almost on a daily basis? Well, informally, um, some of us would talk about our disdain for it and how it made the department look, uh, what a negative light it cast uh, over the department as well as the community. Uh, we should be all, uh, we should be about community trust and, and building our relationships. And uh, somehow uh, that got sidetracked. So would it be fair to say that there are those in the department who actually accept the existence of these cliques and subgroups along with their concern? It seems that that's what, that's what they're expressing. No, I don't know of anyone that would accept. No, I don't mean accept that it's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean accept the fact that they exist acknowledging the fact that they exist. I can't say personally I've talked to anyone about that specifically. But they, you did hear them in conversation with you informally express concerns about it. Absolutely. Okay, good. So my other question is um, with this shot caller concept, um, uh, are you aware of any concerns that those in the department who are concerned about cliques and gangs, have any of them discussed that possibly the shot callers are also engaged in directing retaliation at families, at the families of those who have uh, lost their lives, their family members have lost their lives in uh, context with uh, deputy shootings? No, I never heard that. Okay. Thank you so much. Irma? <clears throat> Hello. First, I want to thank you. I, I know it was difficult to come here and testify and answer some tough questions. My question for you, when you were asked about whether or not you were being used, your response was yes. But can you expand on why you think the public would have thought that about you? Well, to say that I felt I was used in, in the context you're saying is when I was given that order, uh, I believe that order to not look into the subgroup aspect of that incident, to me, uh, I thought that at the time it was just like it was rumored, a drunken brawl, uh, just would have drunk deputies at, a, at an event and also that the sheriff was in conference with the OIG and county council in not pursuing that for whatever reason. Uh, I thought it was unusual uh, at the time, but I didn't know above my head what, why that decision was made. So in hindsight now, knowing that uh, you know, some definite deputies were significantly injured uh, and knowing uh, more of the history of that station, which should probably be demolished, obviously. Um, it did cause me some concern. So it never crossed your mind that your promotion was your reward for stopping this investigation? No, because I was promoted before I got that order. I was promoted on December 6. I got that order on December 7. Yeah, but got <laughs> okay. Um, you said you was just following orders. And I can relate to that because I also spent 30 years in the military and I was a commander three times. So I understand following orders, 
but I also understand when you feel that order is illegal or you have concerns about an order, you ask your superiors about the order. And you said it never crossed your mind to ask the sheriff about that order. Can you sort of explain a little bit more? You thought it was odd, but you didn't feel it was in your privy to try to get a clarification on that order. I felt the sheriff had more information than I did. Again, it was always propagated as being a drunken brawl only, just um, a mutual combat between a bunch of drunk deputies. And I didn't know, uh, again, if there was further information that I wasn't privy to. And that was just a decision to not you know go overboard we'll say but you were the director are you saying your subordinates did not give you complete information about what was going on with the investigation no i'm sorry you were in charge yes right mm -hmm. so you get reports from your subordinates who's doing the leg work so was that the final well, report that it was just a brawl the final report mm -hmm. The final report, it wasn't filed, uh, obviously, by the DA's office. And uh, mind you, now my position is chief. I have commanders and captains running that division, so I'm not in day-to-day -day communication with that investigator with that particular case. So at that point, once I promoted, now I'm responsible for the entire division, so I'm on the other responsibilities trusting that my commanders and captains are handling the investigation. Okay. And if they need to tell me something, uh, that they would bring it to my attention. Did you ever speak to the family members of the severely injured police? No. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? JP? Well, I also want to thank you for being here today, Chief. I know this has been difficult, and I really appreciate your candor in coming here and answering these questions. I do have a couple. Um, the 8-13-2020 news conference. Is it typical for a division chief to call for a news conference that isn't first approved by the sheriff? Um, it would be approved by the sheriff. Yes. So the point of my question is, who initiated this press conference? Press conference? Was it self-initiated on your part, or, no. the, or were you directed by the sheriff? Sheriff. Yes. Okay. The sheriff is part of the press conference. Right. Okay. Yes. So you were acting on behalf of the sheriff. Yes. Making the statement. Yes. But you're saying you did not run your statement through sheriff or sheriff's information bureau to see what you were going to say. No, I did not. Okay. No, that's not true. That's not true. I had somebody look at it. it. I did have somebody look at it, but not for, just for editing, not for content. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to 2018. Um, There was a point where this was, this was going to be an ICIB investigation. Um, and just answer for me, uh, Chief Gooden, was he the Chief of Professional uh, Standards Division at that time? Chief. In 2018, Chief Gooden? No, he was the Central Patrol Region. Okay, so he was Central Patrol. East LA, he's over East LA. Okay, thank you. Said. And Commander Curtis Jensen? Over, he was Commander over East LA. Okay, Patrol thank you very region. much, all right. Um, About how many people were interviewed in the course of the investigation at ICIB? Just roughly. Well, according to Child's record, over 70. 70? Over 70. Okay. How many of those would you believe were um, subject of the investigation who actually were had criminal culpability as opposed to those who were interviewed as witnesses? Oh, I, I just 
a guess how, how many because three people were fired three people were fired yes okay so would it be safe to assume that there was the balance of that 70 were interviewed as witnesses <laughs> oh absolutely they were interviewed as witnesses as being a party goers okay and you're saying that the majority of those people refused to answer questions about gang affiliation or cliques? Um, from what I understand, yes. Okay. And at this point, you're the chief of, now you're the chief of professional standards division, correct? Yes. And by your own statement, you are now over ICIB and IAB. Yes. When did the district attorney return and their findings that they were not going to file on the deputy sheriff's or criminal conduct. that i don't know i don't know exactly okay were you the chief yes. when that occurred yes okay what is the normal course of events when there's been an internal criminal investigation conducted and the district attorney has refused to file charges what happens then in that case goes to uh, IAB okay. for administrative did, investigation. Did this case go to IAB for administrative investigation? Yes. Were those people who, I'm, I thought you were gonna say something else, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Were those people who were interviewed and refused to answer questions about gang or clique affiliation, were they then compelled to answer those questions in the internal investigations? In the internal affairs investigation of that incident? Uh, I haven't read the internal, uh, I haven't read that investigation, but yes, there's, there should be, that's policy that dictates that they be invest, uh, excuse me, that they, uh, they're compelled to answer. But you don't know if that in fact happened? No, I don't. It appears that it did not happen, by the way, but uh, but you're not aware of it. <clears throat> but go ahead, go ahead, JP. I'm sorry. Are you testifying? Um, let me I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I just had one follow-up question that has to do with a finding. I think we we need to decide whether to make. But um, Chief Person, you referred to. Um, the fact that the sheriff's department is a paramilitary organization, and I think that would include that the sheriff's department has a chain of command, correct? Yes. Uh, would you agree that if you have a deputy shot caller, part of a deputy clique or subgroup um, at a station, that that undermines the chain of command at, in those stations in which the shot callers are operating? Uh, I'm could you repeat that? Okay. Would you agree that a deputy shot caller who's part of the deputy clique at a station um, undermines the chain of command at those stations? Yes. Um, so if you have a deputy clique with shot callers, um, the policies and rules that are set, the rules of conduct that are set by the sheriff department uh, can be ignored by a deputy clique member essentially without consequences at those stations. Is that not correct, sir? It shouldn't be. But no. that's what's ha that's what happens when a deputy uh, a deputy clique or subgroup is uh, <clears throat> controlling the station with shot callers, is it not? Then I would hold that um, captain of that station responsible for that. Well, I do too hold him responsible, but I'm wondering whether anybody else is holding him responsible, like the sheriff. But um, yeah, I mean, but the fact is, uh, I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to make argument here. I, let me let me limit my questions to actual questions. Thank you. Uh, Patty, you have another question. Oh, yeah, I have a, a follow-up question. Um, it really has been portrayed, and the sheriff is on record as uh, to the public and to the press that that whole Kennedy incident was a drunken ball, brawl. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was really described, portrayed, um, and almost like as that's all it was, even though there were serious injuries. So this idea of drunken brawl, is there a kind of... Uh, ethos or common thinking that this happens and it's like boys will be boys or cops will be cops and this happens occasionally people go out they get drunk and they get into mischief and sometimes people get beat up um I, we probably can't probably if people have been reprimanded for this before we probably it's all 
in personnel files and we maybe can't know, maybe the OIG can find out. But uh, in your view, in your view, have you heard before this idea of, yeah, that was a drunken brawl? No. No? No. So you think that even though it's portrayed as something not significant, significant that when there is serious in injuries, a drunken brawl would be taken extremely seriously? Absolutely. All right, thank you. JP. Yeah, let, let me just follow up again on the internal affairs investigation. I can appreciate that at the time this occurred, it may have been perceived by some as nothing more than a drunken brawl. Um, however, by the time the district attorney had rendered a decision that they were not going to file criminal charges, quite a length of time had passed. It's my recollection that at that point, it was much more widely believed that there was something more involved than just a drunken brawl, that the banditos were involved in this. And it would seem to me that the department would really want to know through this internal affairs investigation if there was, in fact, a group identified as the banditos at East LA Station that had some involvement in this. You spoke earlier to the point of motive that would have perhaps given a much more clear indication of motive, although the criminal case was already finished. But I find it interesting that there didn't seem to be any particular interest on the part of sheriff's executives in determining through this internal affairs investigation where people could be compelled to answer questions or be fired that we never got any more information about the existence of a group called the Banditos at East LA Station. I, I just find that curious. Do you find that curious also? Well, I can say that uh, knowing what I know now uh, does arouse a lot of speculation. And uh, should it have been investigated more vigorously? Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, knowing what I know now. Uh, again, this wasn't the only investigation that I oversaw. Absolutely. You know, uh, being a big department that we are. Uh, but uh, more could have been done. Thank you. Bill? Um, <clears throat> yes, Chief Person. Knowing what you know now, do you believe that <clears throat> The um, reason you were told um, at the direction of the sheriff to pause your investigation into um, <clears throat> the events at the East LA station and the gang activity there, um, or whatever one is calling that, um, had to, something to do with the fact that the sheriff himself had um, uh, been a deputy at that station? I don't want to speculate, ma'am. I just, you know, I, I, I can't say for sure, but uh, it's just, it just looks bad overall. Thank you very much. Mr. Dexler, may this witness be excused? Yes, sir, and thank for his uh, service. Thank you, Mr. Burson. We appreciate you coming here to testify before this commission. It's 1045 almost. We're gonna take a 15 minute break. We'll resume at 11 a.m.
<laughs> and we have about two minutes remaining for break. So uh, if you're in the room, please have your seats and get ready to resume. For those of you that are online, we should be resuming at about 11 a.m. Thank you. Answering it, oh, not the case. I'm not taking notes. Actually, I'm just done. It might I feel like I'm at that point, you know, second and a half year associate. Somebody else is probably What's Ari's job? What did you do? They're not back there. Oh, they were. I the staff. <laughs> yeah, but I ran out of money here. No, I taught yoga in Santa Cruz and so I just coached a school water polo team. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh maybe Del Oh yeah. I would like Delmise. to like the law is just We're gonna start up in about one minute, Mr. Dyson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Foreman is going to examine Mr. Del uh, Yes. Oh, Great. Right. I think we need to do that. Yes. 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 Mr. Foreman, it's nice to see you. Uh, uh, nice to see you. Former uh, Deputy Chairman Federal Kennedy. Public Defender represented here. <laughs> Do we have everyone? It's yeah. we're going to start up. Jennifer, we can start. <laughs> we're going to uh, resume this fact finding hearing, and uh, Mr. Dykesler, you've announced that uh, the next witness is going to be done by Mr. Uh, Foreman. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Foreman is going to examine uh, former Chief of Staff Delmes. Uh. Do we have the witness? Yes. Uh, testing. Is Mr. Delmis on the Zoom? He is. This is this is Tim O'Connor, I attorney for Mr. Delmis, and he is on Zoom. He is ready. Mr. Delmis, can you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. Mr. Foreman? Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chief Del Meese. Uh, my name is Bill Foreman. I represent the Loyola Law School Center for Juvenile Law, a stakeholder in these proceedings. Uh, could you please um, say and spell your name for the record? Lawrence Del Meese, L A W R E N C E. D E L M E S E. Now, uh, Chief Del Meese, were you employed by the LA Sheriff's Department? I was. I am retired. And when did you retire? In uh, February of 2020. And could you give me a short rundown of your time with the Sheriff's Department from the year you started and the different posts you held? Well, I began uh, 1985. Uh, the Sheriff's Academy, I graduated and went to PDC South for about uh, 33 months and worked in that custody environment. And uh, 1988, I went to Lenox Sheriff Station and worked in a patrol environment at that station until 94. In 1994, I transferred to West Hollywood Sheriff Station to work patrol. And uh, in 1995, I transferred to Safe Streets Bureau to work the gang enforcement team. 
I work Century Gang Enforcement, Lakewood State Gang Enforcement, and Lennox Gang Enforcement until I promoted to Sergeant in 1998. My first assignment as a patrol sergeant was Century Sheriff Station for about a year. And I came back to Lennox Sheriff Station and worked as a patrol sergeant for about a year. I went to the gang enforcement team of OSS in 2000 when we started the Compton contract. And I was the gang enforcement sergeant at Compton when we started. After a few months, I transferred to detective division. I worked auto theft, commercial crimes, and then I spent five years at major crimes with the U.S. Marshals Task Force as a TFO supervisor. Around 2007, I promoted lieutenant. I went to Palmdale Station for about a year, worked West Hollywood Station, where I was a detective bureau commander for about four years. In 2012, I went back to OSS as a uh, field lieutenant for about six months. And then I went to South LA Station as the operations lieutenant. I promoted in November of 2013 to captain, was assigned to Major Crimes Bureau. After a short period of Major Crimes Bureau, I was assigned to Port Services Central where I spent a little over four years as the captain of Central Bureau. In 2018, I was brought on to Alex Villanueva's campaign. I was promoted to commander for one day and then chief to be his chief of staff. I stayed in his chief of staff role for six months, ending July 1st. 2019. Then I spent the remainder of my time as the region or the North County uh, Division Chief until my retirement, February of 2020. Thank you for that history, um, Chief Delmise. Uh, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about your time at the Lennox Station. Was there a deputy clique at the Lennox Station called the Grim Reapers? Yes, there was. And what were the Grim Reapers? Uh, more of a fraternal group. This was the, you're talking about my time there in patrol in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Talking about first, let's take your personal experience. That's yes, my what, what, personal experience. Okay. And uh, do you know that the Grim Reapers still exist as a deputy clique? Is that within your knowledge? I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, were you a member of the Grim Reapers? Well, I'd like to uh, invoke my right of privacy on that. Uh, I am retired from the department and I really do not want to discuss, you know, myself. Uh, Chief Del Meese, I'm going to ask you again, and I haven't heard an objection from your attorney instructing you not to answer. Were you a member of the Grim Reapers? I'm, obje I'm objecting, objecting on the basis of that the witnesses of my privacy. He's provided an answer, so, so that's him. What do you testify for? What, what is the right? The, the objection from the attorney is the yeah. right of privacy. Absolutely. Chief, and, and the witness has given his answer. So are right. you instructing the witness not to answer, sir? I have not instructed the witness not to answer. Well, then we expect an answer. I I would. Ask the commission that uh, Chief Del Meese be directed to answer the question: Was he a member of the Grim Reapers? The, the, I, you need to answer the question. You're under subpoena, sir. <clears throat> the witness has provided an answer, and I would like to point out to this commission that there, there was an attempt was to influence his testimony, testimony prior to his proceedings. It was witness tampering. I had to write a cease and desist letter to the attorney that was engaged in that. This commission has announced civil attorneys from various firms that uh, are assisting in this commission. And my question to this commission is, is Vincent Miller, who not only attempted to influence this witness's testimony, but also threatened me 
with a criminal action for writing a system to system letter. Okay. Violation of rule, professional rules and responsibility 5 100, which is for any criminal disciplinary charges, which we did with the incident. <laughs> Vincent General. Miller is not affiliated with this commission, Good. so I'm not sure I understand what your uh, objection has to do with this proceeding. We wanted to make sure this was an attempt to influence his testimony that it wasn't coming from this commission. Uh, he's here to testify voluntarily, even though he was a female. Uh, he's here to cooperate. And he's it's not voluntary. It's, it's a subpoena, and the question is, were you a member of the Grim Reapers. Okay, well, I yes, I was a member of the Grim Reapers. Thank you. Mr. Foreman? What does it mean to be a member of the Grim Reapers? From my experience, it was a fraternal group that worked hard, and receive some recognition from their peers. Why was it called the Grim Reapers? I don't know. I didn't create the name. Uh, is there a tattoo associated with the deputy clique, the Grim Reapers? I believe there is. What is that tattoo? The Grim Reaper. Okay, that's that's the figure of death with the hood and, and the skull and the scythe. That's Correct. the figure. Okay. Uh, are the tattoos numbered, individually numbered? By the I, believe they, I believe they were at that time. What did the numbers signify? The order that you received it. Okay. Um, do you know why a deputy clique, uh, a group of deputies who are charged with protecting people from violence and to uphold the law, would choose a symbol of death for their group? No. Uh, so, uh, members could have the tattoo of the Grim Reaper. Would there, would there be a specific place on the body uh, that members would have the tattoo of the Grim Reaper? At that time? Yes. I believe it was on our ankle. It was left or right, or did it matter? I don't know if it mattered. Okay. Did you ever get a Grim Reaper tattoo? Yes. Okay. And do you still have that tattoo? No. Did you have it removed? I'm going to object. You're invading the right of privacy of the witness. He has medical privacy. That's a medical procedure. You cannot delve into that. And I'm objecting uh, on that basis of invades his medical privacy and invades his right of privacy. The, the objection is medical privacy. That's an evidentiary objection. You're the right of privacy making. is absolutely an evidentiary objection. And I told you you're delving into medical matters because you're asking him about a medical procedure which removal of a tattoo is. Are you? I'm, uh, I'm not instruct, I've not instructed the witness. It'll be very clear if I instruct the witness. I'm making the objection. I would ask that Mr. O'Connor's objections then be limited to objections from now on if they're not instructions. We've gotten several speaking objections. Yes, we, we just need the objection. Thank you. And uh, uh, now, uh, Mr. Delmis, can you answer the question? Yeah, rephrase the question, please. I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat the question. Uh, when did you have your tattoo removed? Um, twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen, somewhere in there. Why did you remove your tattoo of the Grim Reaper? Because I believed it had become. Um, just something that didn't serve me in any purpose. Uh, had it served your purpose up until 2018? No, it, uh, it served me no purpose from the day I got it. Um, but it had obviously become uh, a liability. In what way was having a gang tattoo for a sheriff's deputy a liability? Well, I think with uh, the in looking at how things have progressed in this issue, um, the perception is a lot different today than it was in 1990. Um, you know, the the whole meaning behind it, uh, the groups that um, have been identified by your commission and the activities that they're 
are taking don't lend themselves to professional law enforcement of which <laughs> I subscribe to. Is it your testimony that the uh, current conduct of the cliques is not consistent with professional law enforcement? Is that what I yes. heard you say? I, I believe it, it, it becomes could a liability. You, could, well, could you elaborate on that, Mr. Delmese? I think it becomes a liability to the employee, their career, and the department. Is it a bad look, as they say? Yes. Uh, did your tattoo have a number? Yes. What was your number? 2-2. Two, two. What does the 2-2 two, two signify? Apparently, I was the 22nd person. The 22nd member to be inducted into the Grim Reapers? I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, do you know what number they're up to now in Grim Reaper tattoos? I have no idea. Uh, was it limited on what kinds of deputies could join the Grim Reapers when you were a member? For instance, uh, uh, could a woman become a Grim Reaper? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Were you aware of any women who offer deputies who are Grim Reapers? I don't have any knowledge of that. Okay. Uh, were you aware of any black deputies who are Grim Reapers? I have no knowledge. Uh, if a, a deputy wanted to join the Grim Reapers, how would they go about doing that? Is there an initiation? Not that I know of. What did you do to join the Grim Reapers? I really can't tell you. I was asked. Asked by whom? People that I worked with. Could you name those people? I don't recall exactly. Most of them are retired or some of them are passed away. Um, I don't recall in particular one person. What is it they saw in you to the extent they told you that they decided that they were gonna ask you to be a Grim Reaper? Um, professional work product, I, I don't know. Uh, are you familiar with the term shot caller? in the context of the sheriff's department's deputies cliques. I've heard that used today. Was there a shot caller for the Grim Reapers in the Lennox department, the times you were there? No. Uh, did the Grim Reapers uh, play any role in assignments in Lennox division? Not that I remember. Had nothing to do with promotions? No. Uh, so what was the point of the group? Uh, social, maybe, I don't know. You were a member for about over 20 years and you can't say what the purpose of the Grim Reapers was? Like I said, it, uh, it served me no good over that 20 years. Um, something that I got and it's something that I got rid of. Do you know what a, a Brady list is or Brady information from your work as a sheriff's deputy? Yes, I'm familiar with the concept of Brady. Uh, what is it? Brady v. Maryland was a case that uh, was decided. Well, are you, I asked, are you familiar with the Brady list? So have you heard that frame before? That, that I have. Before? And what is that? A list of deputies that uh, should not should be made available to the defense if they're testifying in a criminal court case. And why should that list of deputies be made available to the defense? Why are those it, deputies on that list? I thought it was for uh, engaging in improper uses of force, uh, things of things of that nature. There's and a criteria, I don't know what it is. Do you recall that one of the points of contention between former Sheriff McDonald and Sheriff Villanueva in the election in 2018 was whether the sheriff should hand over the department's Brady list to the district attorney's office? Did you ever hear that? I don't recall that. 
Do you did you know that you're on the sheriff's department Brady's list? No, I've never received notification to that effect. Could we pull up uh, exhibit two, please? I represent that this is a uh, exhibit two are, are various printouts from the website jiglio bradylistcom And that website describes itself as says the United States Department of Justice has initiated a methodical approach called proactive disclosure in conjunction with the open government directive. This Brady list platform allows organizations, prosecutors, and peace officer standards and training departments to enter their independent findings in any number of cases in direct compliance with Brady and the Freedom of Information Act. And we have exhibit two open and I'm gonna very faint writing. Uh, I, I'm gonna represent to you, uh, Chief Del Meese, that I went to Brady list and I typed in the name Lawrence Del Meese. And that is written uh, it's in faint writing below the silhouette there. And what I got was Brady offenses, gang activity. So is this the first you're learning that you're on a Brady list for gang activity? This is the first I've been notified. Okay. And there was also a, we turned the page, page two. Official statement, Grim Reapers associate slash N dot G and L.G. v. County of L.A. CV 13-08312. And then you'll see also there's a tab there right below it that says view PDF. I clicked on that tab and when that brought us to page three. Can we go to page three, please? And this is what we have here. Lauren Stelmies, gang activity, and uh, official statement, Grim Reapers Associate, N, G, and L, G, the County of Los Angeles. Um, are you familiar with that lawsuit, N, G, and L, G, the County of L.A.? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, do you know if there was any evidence in that lawsuit identifying you as a Grim Reaper associate? I have no idea. That lawsuit involved David Ch Chavez. Is he a Grim Reaper? I don't know. Have you heard that name before? I believe he worked at South LA Station when I was there. Uh, did you know him then? I know who he is. Uh, but you didn't have knowledge that he was a member of the Grim Reapers? Not to my knowledge. Did you know that he's been involved in at least two fatal shootings? No, but I take your word for it. That lawsuit that appears on your Brady list uh, is also, also involved deputies Juan Meza and Lauren Swanson. Do you know them? I believe they all worked there when I was there. When you say there, that's the South LA station? South LA, yes. And uh, do you know if Juan Meza and Lauren Swanson were members of the Grin Reapers? I do not. And did you know that both of them were also involved in fatal shootings? I will take your word for that. That's the first you're hearing this? Yes. But you have no idea why you would be named uh, in a lawsuit uh, in court as a Grim Reaper associate and that this would appear um, as a gang activity on the Brady list. I don't recall being deposed for that lawsuit or testifying at all. Okay. Uh, do you have an estimate of how many Grim Reapers are now in the Sheriff's Department? I'm retired, sir. I have no idea. Well, let's go back to the day you retired. What would be your estimate of that? I have no idea. Well, was it more than 10? Sir, I, have, I left Lenox Station in April of 1994 as a line patrol deputy. And I know there was probably 22 up to that point. So the time you were, say, chief of staff, to Sheriff Villanueva, you had no idea how many Grim Reapers there were in the Sheriff's Department. No. Um, now, you were deposed in another matter uh, in April this year, and you testified that you were 
uh, familiar with through your experience with other subgroups within the sheriff's department. Which subgroups uh, are you familiar with from your own personal knowledge? I think the question in my deposition was, uh, was there regulators at Century Station when you were there? And some of the other units that I worked, and I think my response was, I, you know, they were probably there. I don't even know if they existed then, but there were subgroups at Century Station when I worked there. I okay, just what were th didn't know which ones they were. Okay, you don't recall what subgroups were at Century Station? <clears throat> Not when I was there, no. Okay. When, well, at some point, did you learn of what subgroups are at Century Station? I had heard of the Vikings. And I have subsequently heard of the regulators, but that's the limit of my knowledge. How did you hear the presence of those subgroups at the Century Station? I read about them, the Vikings in the newspaper, and heard rumors when I worked there. You heard rumors when you worked in Century Station that the Vikings were a subgroup there? Correct. Okay. What about the regulators? I don't know if they were uh, a group at that point. It was when you worked at the Lennox station, were there other deputy cliques there other than the Grim Reapers? Not to my knowledge. What about the South LA station where you worked? Not to my knowledge. Okay, I want to go forward to 2018. Um, and you said you were um, what? You worked on the uh, the campaign for uh, then candidate Villanueva, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you know uh, Chair Villanueva before your involvement on the campaign? No, I did not. You had never worked with him before? No, I had not. How did you become involved in the campaign? We had just finished working for Bob Lindsay, and he lost in the primary, and I was invited to uh, work for Villanueva. Who invited you? Eli Vera. And uh, in, uh, did you then have a meeting with candidate Villanueva where you could, where he talked with you about your role in the campaign? We did meet with Villanueva and uh, at some point specific roles were discussed. And did uh, candidate Villanueva uh, ever ask you if you'd been a gang member or affiliate? No. And what was your role in the campaign? To replicate uh, what we had done with uh, Bob Lindsay, basically uh, going with him to constituent meetings and uh, keeping him on point, keeping him focused. Uh, focused on what? on the issues that he was subscribing to at that time. Were any of those issues uh, the problem of deputy cliques in the sheriff's department? No, I don't recall ever having a conversation with him about that. That was during the campaign. You don't recall ever having a conversation with candidate Villanueva about deputy cliques. Correct. Uh, and then uh, there's the election. And does he ask you to become chief of staff? Yes. Oh, did he say why he selected you to be chief of staff? Well, during the transition, I was uh, kind of the secretary. Um, I had access to Sheriff's Data Network, whereas a lot of the people we were dealing with were retired, um, somewhat organized. So I think it kind of just fell into a, a role of assisting him. And I think that's why he asked me to be the chief of staff. When he asked you to be chief of staff. Did you say anything to him along the lines of there's something you got to know? I'm a member of a deputy clique called the Grim Reapers. No. And he didn't ask you ever if you were a member of a, a group, did he? No. Uh, did you have your tattoo removed before or after his election? It was in that time period. In the time period of the well, the elections one day. Was it before that day or was it after that day? I, I don't recall. I know I was intending to do it at that time. I don't recall exactly when I did it. But you thought it would be a liability going forward in the department to have this visible marking of your affiliation with the Grim Reapers, correct? C correct. So you covered it up. You had it, you had it 
removed. Correct. Uh, the sheriff tasked you with different uh, jobs during the transition. W what were they? I'm sorry. I what was jobs broken. Did you, during the transition from the McDonald administration to the Villanueva administration, you were tasked with cer certain jobs. So just tell me what you were doing for him during that transition period, which was roughly was, November. I'm sorry. Let, let me just situate you. Roughly November 2018. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. I was basically uh, coordinating meetings between people um, at his election headquarters, uh, contacting people and asking them to come there if he if that's what he wanted to have done. Um, so I was like a scheduling guy. Uh, just a scheduling guy or do you have other responsibilities? There was no articulated responsibility, so we divided up the issues between myself, Ray Leva, and a few other folks that were there. Uh, and it's safe to say that during the transition period, well, that the uh, Sheriff Villanueva ran on a platform of cleaning house. Isn't that fair? I believe that was one of his platforms, yes. He was going to get rid of the old management and the old ways, right? Correct. Uh, and, uh, that was one of the 1st things that, uh, Villanueva asked you to do, wasn't it? Was to get help get rid of the old management, isn't it? He asked me to send an email with the names of managers that he was going to demote. At will employees. And I, I sent that email for him. You sent that email for him to who? Uh, Le Anthony LaBerge and Jim McDonald. Did you send that email to anyone else? Not that I recall. And I'm a little confused on the record. Exactly what did this email that you sent at the asking of Villanueva to McDonald and others say? A list of at will employees that he did not want to retain their job duties. When you say he, you mean Villanueva, correct? Villanueva, yes. And did you help him compile this list of at-will employees that he wanted to terminate? No, he told me which names to put on that list on the email that I sent. And the he again is Villanueva? Correct. Do you know what criteria Villanueva used in identifying those names? No, I do not. Uh, in this email, did you uh, tell the recipients that they could either take a full rank demotion or retirement? I don't recall the substance of the narrative, but that probably would have been accurate as they were at will, chiefs and above. And I believe commander is the last civil service rank. So they had the options to demote to commander. In your experience with the sheriff's department, what circumstances justify a full rank demotion? Is it a change in the sheriff? I had never experienced it, so I have no rip, nothing to base it on. Uh, and aside from McDonald and LaBerge, can you recall any other names of persons on that email who were either terminated, told to retire, or given a demotion? at because that's what Villanueva wanted to do? I don't recall who was on the list of names, no. When did you send that email? I don't recall the exact date. Was it before Villanueva took the oath of office or was it during the transition period? I think the transition, oh, you're talking, before he, I'm talking about the transition period that was before he was sworn in. Are okay. Is there another transition period? Because I, no, that's, I wasn't involved about, with that. We're talking about the same transition period. Okay. Okay. So I think the record's clear is that you sent this email before Villanueva was sworn in as sheriff of Los Angeles County, correct? Correct. Now, as people are being terminated, some people are being rehired. Uh, and one of the tasks you got was to reinstate Karen Mandoyan. Is that right? 
That is not correct. Okay. Well, put it in your words. What were you asked to do with respect to Karen Mandoyan? I was asked to contact Alicia Alt, the then Chief of Professional Standards, and let her know that I had been given a settlement agreement and I would be emailing that to her. That was all at the request of Alex Villanueva. Uh, had you seen the settlement agreement before you, um, the, the, well, where did you get the settlement agreement from? Who gave it to you? I believe it was someone at the, the transition. It may have been uh, Mandoyan's attorney. I, I don't recall. Well, was Mandoyan's attorney part of the transition team? I believe he was present on certain days. For whatever reason, I don't know. What's the name of Karen Mandoyan's attorney? Uh, Michael Goldfeder. And you believe he was present as part of the transition team? Um, I, I said testimony. that he was right. present on certain days. I don't recall how much or when. Present where? At this storefront. What's the storefront? Where the transition team was meeting. Okay. So Mandoyan's lawyer was present in at the transition team headquarters as these decisions were being made about personnel, correct? I don't know about that. I know that he was possibly the one that gave me that settlement agreement. But you don't recall who? No. Did you get it by email or were you given a hard copy of it? I ended up emailing it. I don't know how it came to me. Okay. And let's go back a bit. Who is Karen Mandoyan? A deputy sheriff who was terminated under McDonald. Uh, uh, you knew him, correct? I did. Okay. How did you know him? He worked West Hollywood Station when I was a lieutenant there. When did you first meet uh, Mr. Mandoyan? I don't recall. Was it 20 years ago? I, I don't recall. What, what, was it 30 years ago? I don't believe so. So we're somewhere between 20 years and now. Would you say you've known Mr. Mandoyan for at least 10 years? Yes, I worked with him at West Hollywood and I was there from 2000. Eight to 2012. Okay. And he's a grim reaper, right? I have read that, yes. Okay. You never discussed with him that he's a grim reaper? I may have. I don't recall. Did you ever see his tattoo? I don't recall. Do you know what his number is? No. But when you worked with him, you knew he was a grim reaper. When I worked with him, I don't believe he had uh, that designation. When did he get the designation? I don't know. So how would you know whether he had the designation or not when you worked with him? I don't ever remember that coming up in conversation prior to uh, reading it in the newspaper or seeing him on Channel 7, I believe. Well, you have talked with him about being a Grim Reaper, though, right? I don't recall. I may have. Uh, and... Uh, Mr. Mandoyan, he worked on Villanueva's campaign as well, correct? Yes. Uh, and what was his role in the campaign? I believe he drove him around. Okay. And do you know how Villanueva knew Mandoyan? No. Okay. Uh, were they close to each other? I think they became close. And in fact, uh, uh, Karen Mandoyan was standing next to Villanueva at his inauguration. Isn't that true? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and can we bring up Exhibit 5? And do you, do you, can you see Exhibit 5, Mr. Delmes? Yes. Okay, and is the gentleman uh, to Mr. To, sheriff, to the sheriff's right, is that Karen Mandoyan? Yes. And it appears he's holding the new star or something that the sheriff's about to get. Correct. Okay, thank you. Good. Thanks, Patricia. Um, and you said that uh, he was dismissed from the department. Why was Deputy Mandoyan dismissed from the department? 
I believe it was a domestic violence issue. Um, and uh, reading from a report, um, it's that in 2016, he was discharged for violence against a female deputy. He stalked her, tried to break into her apartment, and then lied about his conduct. The victim testified that Mandoyan used his status as a deputy gang member to try to dissuade her from reporting the offense, stating that as a reaper, he had influential friends who could ruin careers in the department. Uh, Mandoyan had also been involved in two non-fatal shootings in 2013 and 2015. That's not the first time you're hearing uh, about those charges against Mr. Mandoyan, is it? No. Okay. And in fact, when he was disciplined, and uh, when he when he was dismissed in 2016, uh, did you try to intercede on his behalf? No. Uh, did you uh, telephone or talk to um, Alicia Alt about his dismissal in 2016? I read a statement by her that I did, and that may have only been to find out the status of his case. I don't recall making that call. Well, in 2016, were you working in internal affairs? No. What business was the status of his case to you? Personal knowledge. Personal knowledge of what? To see if uh, he was going to be terminated or just get days off. Why did you care? I don't recall. Were you trying to help out a fellow Reaper? No, not that I recall. Not that you recall. So who is Alicia Alt? Retired chief of professional standards. Okay. And so in 2018, at the time of the election, she was the chief of the Internal Affairs Bureau, correct? I believe so. Okay. What is your opinion of Chief Alt? She's competent. Anything else? No. Uh, and so in November of 2018, during the transition period, you telephoned uh, Chief Alt at the request of the incoming sheriff, correct? Yes. And it was, you say, to forward a settlement agreement, correct? That is correct. And in this agreement, uh, called for the full reinstatement of Karen Mendoyan. Isn't that right? I don't know. I didn't read it. You didn't read the agreement you sent to her? No. So you you didn't know what that settlement agreement said, whether he was getting full reinstatement, full back pay, anything? No. Nope. Uh, is that your policy to not read attachments that you send to people? Normally, I would have. This came from Mr. Villanueva, and I was just the messenger. And what did... What did uh, what did uh, Villanueva tell you in connection with contacting Alicia Alt? What did he want you to say? That we had, he, they had a settlement agreement they would like her to take a look at. Uh, did you or, do you know Villanueva reviewed the evidence that led to Mandoyan's dismissal and decide that he somehow deserved reinstatement? Only from public statements that he's made. You've had no communications with him about his efforts to reinstate uh, Mandoyan? Not after the initial uh, meetings where he coordinated a truth and reconciliation panel. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I didn't have any communication with him on it. This uh, settlement agreement you sent, was it sent with the approval of then Sheriff McDonald? Not to my knowledge. Villanueva was not sheriff when he asked you to send this agreement to have it approved for the reinstatement of Mr. Mandoyan. Is that right? I believe I asked her to review it. Just to review it? That's all I was asked. Uh, and did Villanueva explain to you why he was making this ask? why he was forwarding the settlement agreement, why he wanted it to happen? No. Do you know if Villanueva knew that Mandoyan was a Grim Reaper? I don't know. 
Now, you said you, uh, uh, did you first talk to uh, Alicia Alt or did you send her the agreement after you first talked? Could you rephrase that question? Okay, you said you sent her an agreement and you talked to her. I wanna know what happened first, the talk or the send? I believe I, that's the reason I called her was to tell her I was gonna send it. Okay, and uh, how many conversations did you have with Alicia Alt about the Mandoyan issue? Just that one that I recall. Just one that you recall. Uh, you know that she recalls two conversations, right? I don't know. I don't recall. Well, you, she was deposed. Chief Alt was deposed on May 23rd, 2019, in connection with a lawsuit about the reinstatement of Mandoyan. And you attended as the client representative of the sheriff. So you sat there through her testimony. You recall sitting there through that? That's correct. Okay. Um, and do you recall that she testified that she had two conversations with you about the Mandoyan issue? Are you referring to the one we just discussed that I don't recall early on and then the subsequent one uh, that it was connected to the settlement agreement? No, I'm talking about the transition time period. Thank you for the clarification. She talks about two conversations with you in the settlement time period, in the transition time period. Do you recall that I testimony? Re I don't recall that. Well, you were sitting there and you heard this testimony. Do you recall Chief Alt testifying at her deposition that you telephoned her in her office on November 26, 2018? And just about the first thing you said to her was that you were looking at a picture of her on the organization chart for the department. And she asked you if it was a newer photo, meaning were you planning a new position for her, and you didn't answer. Do you recall her testimony on that? I recall the testimony on that. I don't recall the conversation, and I didn't have a uh, org chart with pictures on it, so I was a little confused by all that. Did you have an org chart at all? I may have had an org chart, I believe I downloaded, that did not have pictures. As the designated chief of staff during the transition period, you were going to have an org chart, right? Mm -hmm. Only what I brought, there was no rules as to what I should have or what I shouldn't. Is it your best recollection you had an org chart during the transition period? It is my best recollection I did have one, and it did not have pictures. Um, and. Uh, so do you deny that you began your conversation with Chief Walt by saying that you're looking at the sheriff's org chart? I don't recall that at all. And I didn't recall that at the time she testified to it. You, you did or did not? I did not. Well, let's look at exhibit one, which you would have seen before because it was an exhibit at her deposition. Hmm. She said this, this we, these are, um, thank you for blowing it up. Uh, these are, she testified, these were her notes that she made on November 26, 2018, when you called her in her office, and she's written your name at the top. Do you see that, Del Nice? Mm -hmm. And the first thing she's written there is looking at photo of me on org chart, newer photo, photo. Do you see that? I see that. And she testified that's, she wrote down what you said to her. She testified she wrote it down that day. Do you have reason to think she's lying about that? I don't recall that. Do you have reason to think she's lying about that? I can't make that decision. I don't recall it. Well, do you think that Chief Alt fabricated these notes? I don't know. What leads you to think, well, why do you doubt the authenticity of these notes? I don't know. You're you asking me why questions I don't have answers to. I'd be speculating. So she testified these were her notes made on that day, and there's no challenge made to them. What would be a better, better record of that conversation of November 26, 2018? Her notes of that date or your memory of it today? I don't know. I didn't recall that when she testified to it. I don't recall that happening. 
And you agree that contemporaneous notes are more accurate than memories three and a half years later. That's why deputies make notes when they're taking statements, correct? I would say that would be correct. Um, assuming uh, that Chief Alt's contemporaneous notes are accurate, you understand how that statement could be perceived as intimidating as high ranking officials are being demoted on the org chart, that you're looking at the org chart. I could see that, but she forgot to mention in her testimony that she followed up with a question, is this quid pro quo? And I told her, absolutely not. I'm going off of what her recollection, you have your recollection, I'm looking at these notes. Well, my and recollection it, it, is let me, let me that ask it, we I clarified ask. that in our conversation, but what she testified to, she kind of left that out. So maybe that goes towards your speculative question. Do I think these are accurate or not? Well, you're guessing right now. I'm not guessing. I know she asked me that, and I made it quite clear that it was not quid pro quo. No promises were being made. To for her to do something and receive something in return. So I was the messenger. I just wanted to deliver the message. I didn't want to try to influence the message. I didn't want to, you know, invoke any opinions. I just told her this is what the sheriff elect asked me to do. Okay, Mr. Delmise, please wait till I ask a question. Okay, thank you. Um, she also testified as you were sitting there. He went on to talk about what he wanted me to do. And I'm like, okay, so this is the ask, you know, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, we'll bring you along in the bill and waiver regime. And that's exactly how I took it as a threat. What did you think when you heard that testimony at her deposition? Based on what I just told you, I thought it was inaccurate. And uh, she writes below here, Return to work, Mandoy and Karen, S slash A. And she said the S slash A testified as a settlement agreement. Does that make sense to you? I did provide her a settlement agreement. And then it says below that to chief of division. Do you see that note? Mm hmm Do you recall Chief Alt saying that she told you on that phone call that the request to reinstate Mandoy and needed to go through the division chief of where he was assigned to at the time of his dismissal. Do you recall her saying that? No, I don't recall that. Recall her testifying to that as you sat there. I don't recall it. Do you recall her saying that this note to chief of division reflects that part of that conversation? I don't recall. And you recall her saying that she was not the chief of division to whom the request for reinstatement had to go to. It had to go to Hollywood division because that's where Mendoyan was. Did she push back on you saying, I can't handle this request. This is not who it should go to. She may have, I don't recall. She may have. And her notes indicate that she did mention that. Um, did you insist that she herself handled the reinstatement request? Not that I recall, no. Well, she told you that she was not the proper channel. Did you press her on that? No, not that I recall. Well, so let's look at the settlement agreement that you sent her after this uh, phone call. Let's go on the next page. We have an email exchange between Chief Alt and you, and we have at the bottom here, Lawrence Del Mies, that's your email, correct? Correct. And it, that's, that one is dated November 26, and just says, sent from subject Mandoyan. Do you see that? If you hand out. Okay. You're talking about the subject line? Yeah, right there. You see that? Okay. Okay. Yes, I do see that. And then if you go back up to uh, Chief Alt responded on November 30th, sir, as today is my last day in service to the to the county, I wanted to close the loop on this request. I've given this document to county council to process. Uh, so the document she's referring to is the settlement agreement. Is that your understanding? Correct. Okay. And then if we turn the page, we have the settlement agreement. 
And she's testified there's handwriting on it. Do you see that's her handwriting? She that that's her handwriting. So I don't want to confuse you with that. And have you seen this aside from her deposition? Have you seen the settlement agreement before? Not that I recall. So her deposition six months afterwards was the first time you ever saw the settlement agreement. Correct. Can you go to the last page of the agreement? And do you see there where um, it is her name actually as the signatory on behalf of the department on the settlement agreement? And she testified she crossed it out because that was improper. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Did you put her name down there as the person signing for the department? No. Do you know who did? No. But you sent this to her with her signature, even after no. she told you she could not handle the request that properly it had to go to a different division. As I stated, I did not open that or read it prior to sending it. I was just the messenger. Um, after she told you that she was not the proper person to process this request, why did you maintain to go outside those channels? I don't understand your question. Okay. I do know that I asked, I was asked to send her the settlement agreement. I was asked to call her and let her know I would be sending her the settlement agreement. And as to the rest, I don't recall. Uh, she also testified as you were sitting there that you told her that the reinstatement for Mr. Mandoyan had to be handled immediately before the sheriff took office. Do you deny that you said that? I may have told her that was the sheriff's request, but that was not my request. Was the sheriff's request different from your, wait a minute, was the sheriff's request different from some, some requests that you had? I had no request. I'm the messenger. Okay. Your did... messenger, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. I was just the messenger that she would be receiving that settlement agreement by email. So it was, but you conveyed it was the sheriff's request that this be handled before his inauguration. That this be handled. I, I didn't give her a timeline that I recall. Okay. She testified that you did, that it had to be done immediately. Was she telling the truth when she said that? I don't know if she was telling the truth or not. I don't recall it. Um, she testified they wanted it done while McDonald was in office. They did not want it to be done on Monday when it would have been easier, as I had suggested. And I was told emphatically by Delmes it has to be done by Friday. Do you deny saying that to her? I don't recall saying that to her. Um, and she also testified that you asked to wipe Mandoyan's disciplinary record clean and restore him with full back pay. You recall hearing that testimony? Yes, I recall hearing that testimony. I don't recall ever saying anything like that unless it was written in the settlement agreement. I have no idea where she got that. Well, it was in fact written in the settlement agreement that you sent to her, wasn't it? I don't know. But, well, I know I didn't tell her that. Well, let's go to the first page of the settlement agreement. We page down a little bit. We have here at points one, two, three, and three that the department shall rescind discharge action imposed on Mandoyan on September 20, September 14th, 2016. And in addition, is going to rescind other disciplinary charges for which he wasn't dismissed in 2016. Do you see that? I do. Uh, and she told you, hey, we can't do this. Like this, we've never done this, which is wiping out somebody's disciplinary record. I don't recall having that conversation with her. Once I sent her the settlement agreement, I believe that was the last time I communicated with her. And you didn't communicate with her at all in this conversation what any of the terms of the settlement agreement was. That's your testimony? I don't recall that. You don't recall that. Um, now, uh, eventually, you had a parting of the waves, of the waves with uh, with 
with Sheriff Villanueva over Karen Mendoyan. Is that correct? I had, uh, I was transferred from the sheriff's office to North Patrol. That is correct. And do you believe that was because of a difference of opinion you had with the sheriff ultimately over the reinstatement of Karen Mendoyan? I believe that was part of it. Okay. Can you tell me what part of it that was? Why you, why you believe that? Well, there's two people in that administration that would consistently tell the sheriff no. Ray Leva, he lasted three months. Larry Delmese, he lasted six months. And people that told him yes got promotions one after another that continue on to this day. So I know you've been sitting here, you know, calling my credibility into question, but let's the facts speak for themselves. I had a very short run in that administration for a reason, because I learned from this case not to be the messenger. I learned from other situations to speak my truth. And I think overall that was not appreciated. By the sheriff. Well, let, let me ask you about that, Mr. Delmese. In, in what ways do you think um, speaking the truth was not appreciated by Sheriff Villanueva? By the fact that I got sent to another job and they brought someone else in who would and tell him yes. What, what truth did you speak that led to Villanueva sending you to another job? Daily. Can you give me some examples? Well, you know, unbeknownst to me, the sheriff had uh, spent a lot of money to uh, redecorate the old sheriff's office in Monterey Park. And he came in one day and said, we're all moving to Monterey Park. I told him, I don't think that's a good idea. And I don't know why we would have redecorated those offices, but that's a perfect example of Mr. Villanueva was doing a lot of things outside my knowledge. Uh, but one of the one of the truths you spoke to him is that you thought that the sheriff's department should drop its bid to reinstate Mandoyan. Isn't that right? When it became litigation, I voiced my opinion that one one employee should not be more important than the organization itself. I was always very professional, and the sheriff's department and its reputation are very important to me. And I believe that it was detracting from that, yes. And who gave you the news that you were being transferred from the chief of staff position? Well, as you probably read in my deposition, it was Mr. Murakami. Okay. And uh, you also testified there that you believe Mr. Murakami understood that you were being transferred because of your opposition now to the Mandoyan reinstatement over legal challenges. I did speculate to that, yes. And where were you transferred to? North Patrol. Uh, and was North Patrol the post you retired from? Yes, it is. Um, let's, uh, we've heard some, first of all, did, were you able to listen in on some of the testimony of uh, Chief Burson earlier today? Yes, I did. So I want to ask you some about the Kennedy Hall incident and its testimony. Um, what's your understanding of the Kennedy Hall incident? Only what I've read in the newspaper that it was one group of deputies that attacked another. Okay. So you say it was only what you read in the newspaper. Did you read any internal reports about the Kennedy Hall incident? Not that I recall. Did you have any discussions with um, any of the investigators into Kennedy Hall about the incident? Not that I recall. Did you have any discussions with anybody about the refusal of many deputies to testify about the incident? Not that I recall. That would not have been part of my duties. Uh, so you just read about it in the newspaper. Um, no other knowledge of the incident other than what me and all the other people walking around would know about. It wasn't part of my official duties to be involved in that. Uh, did you think that the incident from what you read reflected poorly on the department? Yes. In what ways? I had a trouble understanding why one group of deputies would attack another. Would that reason be because one group of deputies were members of the banditos and the others weren't? I don't know. That would be my speculation at this point, based on what I've heard. 
Okay, you understood that the Kennedy Hall incident involved allegations that some bandito deputies attacked other deputies, correct? Based on what I read in the Times, yes. Um, and you understood based on what you've read that dispute that the divisions between bandito deputies and non bandito deputies was a possible motive for the crimes, correct? Based on what I've heard today. This is the first time you're hearing that as a motive? It's the first one I recall. Um, uh, did you hear uh, Chief Burson's uh, testimony that uh, one of the points of the Kennedy Hall investigation was to get to the bottom of the uh, role of the deputy cliques in that uh, incident? Did you hear that? I heard him say that that, should, that was the goal he was asked to perform, yes. Okay. And uh, in your experience as a law, uh, law enforcement officer, is it appropriate to get to the bottom of the motive for a criminal act? It is appropriate. Okay. Can you think of any circumstances where it would be appropriate to purposely decide not to investigate motive in connection with a criminal act? No, I cannot. Okay. Uh, and you understood that during the transition period that this investigation of, and when I say transition period, I'm referring to November uh, 2018, after the election and before the inauguration. And you understood that um, during this transition period, the Sheriff's Department was investigating the Kennedy Hall incident, correct? I, as I recall, they were, yes. And uh, uh, who was Matt Burson? What is your understanding of who he was in the role of that investigation? The captain at ICIB. Okay. Uh, and you've heard the testimony this morning, and you probably saw a declaration that Chief Burson said that you called him up on November 27, 2018. And that, for the chronology, that's one day after your call with Chief Alt, which was on November 26, that you called up, he testified that you called him on November 27, 2018, and said you were calling on behalf of the new sheriff, Villanueva, and he should hold off on asking questions about the banditos until the new sheriff arrives. You heard that, right? I heard him say that. Uh, did you make that call? As you probably read in my deposition, I don't recall ever having that conversation with Matt Burson or any conversation with Alex Villanueva regarding the banditos. You don't recall having any conversation ever with Alex Villanueva about the banditos? No. Even when you were chief of staff after the election? I don't, I don't recall ever having that conversation. Never a topic that came up at all? Not in my presence that I recall. And so you don't recall that conversation with uh, Chief Burson. He has a pretty detailed recollection, wouldn't you say? So he says. Okay. Well, are you saying that he's made up that conversation? I'm saying he may have had that conversation, but I don't believe it was with Larry Del Mies. And I'll tell you why. One of your uh, commissioners brought up the point. We are a paramilitary organization. We have a chain of command. If he got message like that for me and didn't go to the under sheriff i don't know why he would not have and if i got that message from alex Villanueva to give to somebody i would have gone to the under sheriff that's not something that i involve myself with okay. especially after the mandate and you were and you remember that that chief alt testified that you were asking her to go outside the proper channels to reinstate mr mandoyan correct I was delivering the sheriff's wishes to Chief Alt. I don't recall ever saying or going outside any official channels. I'm not a personnel guy. I don't know what the official pathway is for reinstatements, but I can tell you, I don't recall ever discussing the banditos with Mr. Burson. So is it, is it your testimony that you don't recall and that it's possible you had that discussion? Well, you know, that's three and a half years ago. And if I didn't get a chance, let me tell the 
commission that I appreciate them letting me testify remotely. I am suffering from my second bout of COVID in the last two months. But that, that aside, I don't recall any of that. But you're not ruling out it's possible you had that conversation with Chief Person. It's possible, but I would say improbable. Do you recall uh, Sheriff Villanueva ever telling you to call uh, Chief Burson about the Kennedy Hall incident? No, I, I would continually connect the sh Alex Villanueva with people on the department when he asked. Did he ask me to call Chief Burson? Probably many times. Do, about what? I have no idea. Uh, and in your experience as a law enforcement officer, what is your opinion of Chief Burson's statement uh, to Deputy Chow that he cancel the interviews so that he would not have to ask questions about the subcultures at the East LA station? Is that good policing? No. Is it corrupt policing? Could be. Could be in what way? If he was trying to obstruct an investigation, I think it could be criminal. Are you concerned about your criminal liability in connection with Kennedy Hall? Not at all. Uh, you're also, you also heard the testimony from, from Chief Burson uh, this morning that he spoke to you um, on December 7th to inquire about the Kennedy Hall status. And you again said on behalf of the sheriff that the, um, they were not to ask any questions about the banditos. Very interesting when he testified that he was in the sheriff's office it, with I, Ray Leva and the sheriff and me the day prior. I don't know why he wouldn't have brought it up to them directly. So it's very convenient that he keeps quoting these conversations that we had that I don't recall. You don't recall one way or the other, correct? That is very improbable. Uh, and it was in that meeting on December 6th, that's the one you're talking about, that uh, Burson was promoted uh, from captain to chief. Do you know why that promotion was made? Well, after firing all his chiefs, uh, the sheriff had no choice but to promote a lot of uh, people, more than one rank, to fill those positions. Uh, was any message delivered to Chief Burson in connection with this promotion of what he was expected to do, say, in, perhaps in connection with Kennedy Hall. I don't recall the meeting, let alone what was said. Uh, do you recall meeting at all on December 6th with the sheriff and Leva and Burson? No. You don't remember that meeting at all? I don't remember that meeting at all. So there are at least four people there. We'll have to ask the other, other two who to testify about that, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, and Kennedy Hall was a big story in the press, correct? It was a story in the press. I don't know if it was big or small. Okay. And, uh, but you reiterate that your only knowledge of the incident comes from what you read in the press. You didn't learn anything within the sheriff's department about the Kennedy Hall incident. Not that I recall. It, there's a whole chain of command uh, from the assistant sheriff down that may have been involved in that. Uh, the chief of staff... I wasn't one of them. Okay. And so as chief of staff, you never had any discussions with anyone at the sheriff's department about Kennedy Hall. Is that your testimony? Not that I recall. You had never had any, uh, never read any internal materials about Kennedy Hall, even as chief of staff for the sheriff, correct? That's your testimony? Not that I recall. That's my testimony. Um, did you ever hear about that there were deputies who were refusing to comply with the investigation? Not until testimony earlier today. Okay. And um, I want st to step back a little bit about the sheriff's approach in general to the subgroups. Do you recall that during the, um, the campaign that the issue of sheriff's subgroups, cliques, or gangs uh, was an issue in the campaign between Villanueva and McDonald? It may have been. I'm I'm having trouble recalling exactly in what context. Okay, but you worked on the campaign, but you're not sure. I did some work on the campaign, but I don't know in what context that came up. Did Villanueva say he was gonna to get tough on the subgroups? He may have, he said a lot of things. 
Uh, and uh, you agree that the department should get tough on the subgroups. You think that the deputies should get rid of their tattoos and shouldn't belong to the subgroups any longer. Isn't that right? I do. As I testified, I believe it tarnishes the image of the department. Okay. And do you recall that on his first day of office, uh, Villanueva replaced the head of East LA with Ernie Chavez? Do you recall that? I don't know when Ernie Chavez was promoted to captain and assigned to East LA. I know my job was to find a vacancy because the sheriff wanted to move the captain that was in that role. And he wanted to move him because, as he said in the press, that the banditos had run roughshod over that captain. Isn't that correct? He may have. He didn't. I don't recall discussing why. I just <laughs> recall my actions were finding an open uh, unit for a captain item. But Ernie Chavez wasn't his first choice for that position, was it? Not that I recall. You recall that his that Villanueva's first choice to be the new chief of East LA to clean house was Danny Bottonero, correct? I recall that the sheriff wanted to make Danny Bottonero a captain, and I believe it was at East LA. Okay. Uh, and who was Danny Bottonero? He was a person who retired from the department as a sergeant that I had never met before. And you felt it was going to be next to impossible to take somebody back as a sergeant and then promote them to captain immediately to be in charge of a of an of a uh, station correct as you read in my deposition testimony i spent uh most of my time in that office trying to figure out the nuts and bolts of that and it violated civil ser service rules to bring a sergeant back as a captain and uh did you ask Villanueva why he wanted Batnero in that role? No. Uh, did you know that Batnero is on the Brady list as a founding member of the Banditos? I did not know that. Do you know that he is credited as being one of the designers of the Banditos logo? I did not know that. Well, when Mr. Batnero was being vetted for this position of taking over East LA, was any investigation done of his subgroup affiliation? Not to my knowledge. When anybody was promoted by Chief Villanueva, was there any investigation done of their subgroup affiliation? I think that question would be for Ray Leva in my tenure, and then Tim Murakami after that. As the Chief of Staff, I wasn't asked to or expected to vet anybody. So, but to, in your, to your knowledge, that inquiry never happened where deciding whether someone is going to be promoted, uh, in fact, was a member of a subgroup. You never heard that going on. No, to my knowledge. No. Um, and even though you were chief of staff from December 2018 to July 1, 2019, your testimony is that you never discussed the banditos with Sheriff Villanueva. Not that I recall. Okay. And during that whole time you were his chief of staff, you never discussed with him or had a meeting about dealing with the problem of sheriff's subgroups. Isn't that correct? I don't recall ever being in those meetings. Do you recall if any meetings were occurring where the purpose was to discuss the problem of dealing with sheriff's subgroups? I, there may have been a meeting to that effect with the proper people involved, but I don't recall it. You never heard of it? Three and a half years ago, I don't recall. Um, and the whole time you were the chief of staff, you were not even aware of any kind of plan for addressing the deputy subgroup issue by the administration. Isn't that I was right? not personally, no. Well, you were not aware of any plan, personally or not. You were not aware of any plan. Isn't that correct? That I recall, no. Okay. On the other hand, Chair Villanueva did ask you to set up a meeting with the FBI, the state attorney general's office, and others to investigate Max Huntsman and others for supposedly accessing files improperly. Isn't that correct? As you probably read in my deposition, I did set up a meeting with the outside agencies regarding access of files. As I testified in my deposition, I made, I don't remember if Max Huntsman or Diana Turan or others were the names involved. I didn't get that information on who did it, just that it was done. Well, as you 
talking about your deposition, you also testified that Villanueva was focused on just the most prominent names of who may have accessed the files, including Max Huntsman, correct? Eventually that came out because what of what mean? I read in the newspaper. Okay. Uh, I believe I was gone from that office by that time. Well, in fact, you did set up that meeting with the FBI and the Attorney General's office, correct? I did. And you understood that Max Huntsman and his team, in fact, had authority to access files, correct? Correct. Um, now, Villanueva never asked you to organize a meeting with the FBI to look into subgroups, did he? Not that I recall. Seems like a big thing. Did, did that happen or not? Not that I recall. You just don't recall it. Would you ordinarily remember if he came and asked you, let's set up a meeting with the FBI to investigate the subgroups? I, I don't recall him asking me that. Okay. Uh, and did, he never asked you to set up a meeting with the state AG's office about investigating the subgroups, did he? Not that I recall. Okay. Um, in your personal perspective, a Sheriff Villanueva, who did he think was the biggest, the bigger danger to the Sheriff's Department? The Sheriff's subgroups or Max Huntsman? I don't know. You'd have to ask him that. I'm asking about your perspective on what he was focused on. I, I really can't testify as to what he was focused on other than uh, my job, which was, you know, setting up meetings and introducing him to his executive staff through meetings, uh, making a making sure that the schedule was correct. Uh, I was an office manager. I was not a decision maker. There was five other people in the organizational chart above my rank that made decisions. I came to work and I managed an office. And as an office manager, you never set up a meeting on the issue of the sheriff's subgroups, did you? You were never I'd asked. Have to, I'd have to look at the official you know, schedule to see if there was one. I don't recall ever setting up any meetings like that. And, and subsequently you, after I left, maybe they did have those meetings. I don't recall. You don't know, do you? No, I don't. Uh, but you do recall setting up meetings to discuss the file issue, correct? The what issue? I'm sorry. The issue with the access to files. Well, access to files, yes, because that was both internal and external. And we tried to, uh, find out what the course was going to be on that investigation early on. And you ultimately thought that the whole file issue probably didn't have any merit and should be left alone. Once the uh, attorney general and the FBI decided not to uh, investigate, it was my personal opinion that it should probably be left alone. I pass the witness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Foreman. Does uh, do the commissioners have any questions? May this witness be excused? Well, I mean, other than, I mean, a colossal failure of recollection of things that expect uh, some recollection of, but I have no questions of the witness. May this witness be excused? I object to that comment by the commissioner. It's harassing. It's incorrect. And the witness has testified to the best of his recollection here today and let the record reflect that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Delmise. You're excused. Thank you. Mr. Dykesler, um, want to proceed with your third witness? Do you want to put that over? I, I really tardy. Uh, I'd be surprised if we could complete uh, Chief Tardy and still allow time for uh, public testimony, but it would be my inclination to start if we could. Okay. Uh, takes us. I'm told I have to go to the microphone. Yes that which I just said, which is I would be surprised if we would be completed uh, with the next witness's testimony, Chief Tardy, um, in the remaining time, giving time for public comment. But it'd be my inclination uh, to start the examination of this witness. Uh, Sarah Moses of the Manette Phelps firm is going to be conducting that. Why don't we, uh, why don't we go like a uh, half hour and see how it goes? And then we can always... Uh, Continue the testimony to our next uh, special hearing. Very well. If you're not done. Okay.
Right here. Can you sit down? You want to raise your right hand? Yes. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I did. Good afternoon, Chief Tardy. Good afternoon. As Mr. Dykesler mentioned, my name is Sarah Moses of the law firm Manat, Phelps, and Phillips. I am a member of the special counsel's team that is looking into sheriff deputy gangs, and I'll be asking you some questions today. Can you please state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Sure. April Lynn Tardy. T is in Tom, A-R-D-Y. And how are you currently employed? I am a chief with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department assigned to Central Patrol Division. And the Central Patrol Division includes East Los Angeles and Compton, is that right? That's correct. Can you please tell us briefly how long you've been with the Sheriff's Department and each of the positions that you have held? Yes, I've been with the department for 28 years. I started my career at Sybil Brand Institute for Women in 1994. I went to IRC in 1997 as a deputy sheriff. I then went to Temple Station uh, for patrol. From there, I was assigned to Operation Safe Streets as a gang investigator assigned to Compton Station. I promoted to uh, Sergeant in 2000, January of 2011. I'm sorry, of 2006, and I was assigned to Compton Station for four, uh, five and a half years, and I worked as a field sergeant, a detective sergeant, and the operations sergeant. I promoted to lieutenant in August of 2011 and went to Men's Central Jail, worked there for about two years, and was part of the commander's task force at that time. And I went over to Carson Station as a watch commander and DB uh, lieutenant. From there, I went to South Los Angeles as the operations lieutenant. And then I went to um, Central Patrol Division as the executive aide to Chief Bobby Denham of Central Patrol. I was promoted to captain in October of 2016. And I went over to South Los Angeles where I stayed there a little over two years uh, before I was promoted to commander in January, well, acting commander in January of 2019 where I was assigned to Central Patrol. I was uh, assigned to the chief uh, position in January of 2021 and I'm currently there now. Can you tell me, during the time you were a deputy working in the Operation Safe Streets Bureau, which is the department's effort to combat street gangs, am I right? That's correct. Did you ever hear about a deputy subgroup known as the Jump Out Boys? I had left the unit, I believe, at that time, um, but I did read about it. I don't know of any of the deputies who were involved, but I did hear about the case. When did you first hear about the Jump Out Boys? The first time I heard it was actually in the media. Um, and then I heard talk around the station, uh, the department about the jump out boys. And while you were a lieutenant um, from 2011 through 2016 assigned to men's central jail, did you ever hear about the deputy subgroup known as the 3000 boys? I heard about that. What happened? I got there in August of 2011 and in December of 2010 was the quiet cannon fight involving the deputies. And then that's when I began hearing about uh, 2000 and 3000 boys. I had never worked men's central jail, so I didn't know what that meant. Had you been hearing about the 2,000 boys and the 3,000 boys from members of the department or also from the media? Uh, from members of the department. And during the time you were the captain of South Los Angeles from 2016 to 2019, did you ever hear about a deputy subgroup known as the Grim Reapers or the Reapers? Uh, yes, I had heard about that. What had you heard? Um, I heard that it was a subgroup at the station, um, but I didn't know any members or you know what the tattoo looked like. Now, you became the chief of the Central Patrol Division, which, as we discussed, includes East Los Angeles and Compton. I'm sorry, the commander of the Central Patrol Division in uh, January 2019. Is that right? That's correct. Before you became the commander of the Central Patrol Division, did you know East Los Angeles and Compton's troubled histories with deputy subgroups? No, I'd never heard anything about um, East L.A., um, the Banditos. 
Um, and Compton Station, I'd been there for several years and I'd never heard of any um, troubled history. And so before you started as commander of the Central Patrol Division, no one sat you down and explained that those two divisions had, those two stations had had a troubled history with deputy subgroups? No, that's correct. And what are your responsibilities briefly as chief of the Central Patrol Division currently? I am responsible for risk uh, management issues. Um, personnel, I oversee six stations, uh, probably a little less than 1,600 employees. Um, that, re that includes reviewing cases um, that are for case review. I present in case review. I review cases that are going to the Executive Force Review Committee and Critical Incident Review, um, along with a host of other things, such as budget. And Is part of your role as the Chief of Central Patrol Division ensuring that department policy is enforced? Yes. Does that include the department's policy on deputy subgroups? Yes. And you have, in fact, opened two investigations into deputy subgroups, uh, one in East Los Angeles and one in Compton. Is that right? That's correct. Is it fair to say that you're proud of the work you have done to combat deputy subgroups? So far, yes. I know it's a lot of work um, ahead of us, but I think I'm making some strides. Is it safe to say that having devoted what sounds like your entire professional career to the department, that you care about the int integrity of the department and its sworn officers? I do. Would you agree that participation in law enforcement, subgroups, gangs, or cliques harms morale and erodes public trust? I do. I agree with that. Undermines the department's goals and can create a negative perception of the department? Yes. Increases the risk of civil liability to the part the department and involved personnel. Yes. Okay, let's talk about what we mean when we are discussing law enforcement gangs today. If you could please turn to exhibit one in the binder that should be in front of you. This is penal code section 13670. If you'll take a look, please at section a 2. You have the definition of law enforcement gang, which I will read a portion of. It says law enforcement gang means a group of peace officers within a law enforcement agency who may identify themselves by a name and may be associated with an identifying symbol, including but not limited to matching tattoos, and who engage in a pattern of on-duty behavior that intentionally violates the law are fundamental principles of professional policing. Do you see that? Yes. Chief Tardy, do law enforcement gangs exist in the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department? I would say that deputy subgroups exist um, within our department, um, such as the banditos and uh, what has been deemed as the executioners in Compton. So subgroup, subgroups exist, but law enforcement gangs do not. Is that right? That's correct. Please tell me in your mind what the difference is between a deputy subgroup and a law enforcement gang. Well, I, I know that there is a pattern of, um, we have to refer to the pa pattern of a behavior, on-duty behavior. Um, what separates it for me is, I know that there isn't a, a, anything in court yet so we can call anything a gang until it's been um, heard in court. So a judge or court has to, there are certain criteria, and I'm going back to my gang history. Um, there are certain things that we have to put in place um, in order to, let's say, file a case um, as for a gang. Um, just because we call it a gang doesn't necessarily make it a gang. For instance, um, I want to file a case because I see three people tagging a wall. Uh, that doesn't make them a gang because I say that it is. So I can't file it as a gang. So I'm going to need certain criteria. And one is, you know, a common sign, symbol, or name. Um, tattoo can be one as well. Um, in addition to um, a con a territory that's been defined, a list of membership, and in addition to um, uh, crimes that they've committed. 
that we have predicate acts on. So crimes that they have been charged with. Uh, and that's my definition of a gang. And the reason I call this a subgroup is because that hasn't been established yet. And when you say it hasn't been established yet, do you mean that no court has determined that a law enforcement gang exists? There's been no criminal conviction under this penal code statute. Is that what I understand you? That's you correct. And I'm not saying that it, it it hasn't it hasn't happened yet, but it's possible that it can. Okay, so I, I'm looking at section 13670, um, and I, I don't see anywhere in this definition uh, the necessity of a criminal conviction. And so I am curious. I have read this more times than I'd like to admit. I'm sure you have as well. Um, it's not in there, but can you please tell me? where you came to the understanding that a criminal conviction was necessary. Not necessarily a criminal conviction, but if we're charging a deputy with 13670 PC and it's being submitted to court, what are the other um, areas that they're looking at for filing consideration? That's what I, that's where I'm thinking uh, of this case. Okay. It, it may be helpful to kind of break down this definition into a couple parts as we continue to discuss today. Um, I see three parts here. The first, we have a group of peace officers who identify themselves by a name. The second uh, may be associated with an identifying symbol, including a tattoo. And the third, uh, violate fundamental principles of professional policing. Does that sound like an accurate summary of the three factors that would uh, support a finding of a law enforcement gang? Yes, that's okay. three, yes. Let's talk about uh, the Compton station. Are the executioners a law enforcement gang under penal code section 13670? My answer would be the same um, as previously stated. Do they identify themselves by a name? They do. And that's the executioners or new ink, as I believe you've called them. That's correct. And are they associated with an identifying symbol? Yes, they are. Patricia, can we pull up exhibit four, please? This is the calf of Deputy Samuel Aldama, is this the identifying symbol that the executioners or New Inc. are associated with? Yes, it is. And are you aware of any individual that has this tattoo or has identified as being part of the executioners having violated fundamental principles of professional policing? Not that I'm aware of. You opened uh, a deputy subgroup investigation under the department's policy in 2020, I believe, in the Compton station. Is that right? That's correct. And as a result of that investigation, you moved 11 deputies to non-patrol assignments. Is that right? That's correct. Were any of those deputies moved to non-patrol assignments executioners? They did have the uh, tattoo. Yes, they were self-admitted during the investigation. And so did they do something to violate policy in order to warrant moving them to a non-patrol assignment? Uh, it was a administrative patrol move or administrative moves, transfers um, for the good of the station. So uh, were the transfers to non-patrol assignments discipline or not discipline? It was not discipline. And were those individuals found to have violated department policy at any point in that investigation? No. How about the banditos in East LA? Are they a deputy subgroup? Yes, they are. And they identify themselves by a name, right? They do. And they have uh, an identifying symbol. Is that right? That's correct. Can we pull up Patricia exhibit 14? This is the Loyola report on deputy gangs, page eight of the document. We could zoom in there. Is that image on the left, the symbol 
that the banditos out of East LA associate themselves with? Yes, it is. Are you, are you aware of any bandito having violated department policy or any fundamental principle of professional policing? Yes. What are, what are those violations? Uh, there were several performance standards, conduct towards others, um, and this was part of the Kennedy Hall investigation. So if I understand correctly, we have the banditos who identify themselves by a name and have an identifying symbol, which we're looking at, and have violated department policy in connection with the Kennedy Hall incident. And so explain to me again how that does not qualify as a law enforcement gang. That's the term that I use as subgroups, and I know it's been used here today several times, so. I understand it's your preferred term, um, but we talked about there being three different factors that would establish a law enforcement gang. And from the description you just gave, the banditos satisfy all three of them. So my question is, why is it not? Why are the banditos not a law enforcement gang? According to 13670 PC, that is the definition, correct? And they meet it? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about Kennedy Hall. Can you please summarize that incident briefly for me? Um, a, de a group of deputies at an off-training party uh, were involved in a huge fight in which um, several deputies who had uh, a lot more seniority at the station um, challenged other deputies with less seniority to a fight at the Kennedy Hall. And um, several people were injured and there were several deputies, some on duty and some off duty, who um, either stood by or um, maybe transported some of the victim slash suspects away from the incident. To the hospital, correct? To the hospital and to other locations, yes. The deputies who were more senior, those were banditos? Yes. And is it your opinion that the Kennedy Hall incident was a drunken brawl involving mutual combat between two groups of deputies, or was this bandito violence against non-banditos? Initially, I had heard that it was just a drunken brawl, somewhat similar to the Quiet Cannon um, fight of December 2010. Um, and throughout the investigation, I read that several people were self-admitted um, banditos. You spoke at a press conference on August 13, 2020, regarding the Kennedy Hall investigation, correct? Correct. Let's play a portion of that press conference. Patricia, this, this is going to be Exhibit 7, and there's a question at the beginning that's very hard to hear, so I will say it before we begin in case we can't hear it. The questioner says, and how is this, referring to the Kennedy Hall policy violations that the investigation found, linked to a click or to the banditos. And how is this linked to a, to a click or to the banditos? Well, because of the culture and what I would call some shot callers at the station, there's a difference between a shot caller and a team leader. A team leader is someone who's promoting positive um, behavior in the community, the department, and the station. A shot caller is someone who's trying to uh, manipulate and direct people and control the uh, dialogue of what's going on at the station. So that's what we found, that there were some people who were acting as shot callers at the station and directing people um, to do things such as different schedules and changing schedules and um, having control over the schedules and different events that were going on around the station and the station areas. Do you recall saying that? I do. Can you please tell us what a shot caller is? A shot caller is someone who is a leader of a, a group um, or at the station who is senior and uh, directs the younger deputies as to what the feel of the station should be. That sounds very positive. Is a shot caller a good thing to have in a station? No, we'd prefer to have uh, more seasoned deputies as training and leaders um, and not shot callers. Um, I did say that we found 
uh, during the investigation that there were people who were trying to control the schedule. Um, I did learn during the investigation that there were shot callers who were dictating when and where they could have barbecues and what events they can have barbecues for. So How many of those shot callers you were referring to in that August 13, 2020 press conference were discovered to be banditos during the course of the Kennedy Hall investigation? There were three that were self-admitted um, during the course of the investigation. And if someone is acting as a shot caller, that means they are, by definition, usurping the authority of the captain of that station, right? Absolutely. And that is in violation of department policy? Yes, it is. And that is contrary to fundamental principles of professional policing? Yes, it is. Who are the shot callers you were referring to in that August 2020 press conference? I don't remember all of their names, but they were discharged. Was it uh, Rene Munoz? Yes. Gregory Rodriguez? Correct. And Silvero? David Silverio? Yes. And all three of them were terminated, that's right? That's correct. And there was a fourth who was a sergeant. Um, he was never, um, never self-admitted because I don't believe he interviewed. He was uh, retired. He okay. retired with uh, In no, lieu of. no consequences, correct? Correct. And uh, deputies Munoz, Rodriguez, and Silverio can still get their jobs back. They can appeal their terminations through the Civil Service Commission? Yes, I, I have to go and hear the, um, present their, uh, their case at the department, for the department, so. And when are those hearings scheduled for? I don't know. They've been canceled a couple of times. Do you believe that those deputies deserve their jobs back? I do not. Why is that? Because of the conduct and the behavior that um, occurred that night. Um, the, uh, I'm surprised that the case wasn't um, filed by the DA's office. Um, there was some significant injuries, and um, I don't believe that they represented the uh, badge well. Will you be disappointed if Deputies Munoz, Rodriguez, and Silverio are reinstated? Yes. Should we go for another five minutes, or what's the best? It's... Um... How much more questioning do you have, Ms. Moses? I have quite a bit. <laughs> Would it be appropriate uh, to break? Um, Chief Tardy, we have this uh, courtroom until 1, and so we need to conclude. Would you be able to come back at our next scheduled hearing to finish your testimony? When is the next scheduled? Because I've already canceled my vacation, oh, <laughs> and I'm right. sorry we scheduled sorry. it. So. Um, we have not set the date, so if we worked with you, a date that works uh, so you don't have to cancel your vacation again okay <laughs> i think we can uh, stop here and we're going to take a five minute break and uh allow for final public comments you're excused for now and we really appreciate you coming here thanks thank you Jim. <laughs> Her, you know, what we said that did she say? Who said now? Not the case. Yeah, she's what she can't believe it.
<laughs> and it is 1250 now, so we will be resuming shortly. Please stand by. Just two. Okay. Yeah. Open house. Like pulling people. Well, it is. Yeah, because like I didn't have them cheap. I don't know if she did. So clear when you go see my house. I know the cheap and full she can. Well, I think that's the. Yeah, I'm a father there. I've got no break. But. I think it may be because there's some is it a game but not the yeah. yeah, and it's also a talking point that was made by Tanaka back in the day. Uh, commissioners who are present. I, I, we have a couple of commissioners. I'm so sorry, you're my We're just on a tight schedule. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, it's just the school has us on a tight schedule with the room. No problem. Mr. Dexler, uh, is there anything? We need to do before we conclude this session with uh, public comments as required by the Brown Act. I thought uh, that it would be appropriate to uh, present to the commission a brief offer of proof with regard to the under sheriff Murakami so that there's no uh, question, uh, notwithstanding his uh, alleged physical uh, condition. Uh, that his testimony is uh, relevant, and I would call upon um, Anthony Pacheco, who is the witness, who, who's been assigned that uh, task, if that's okay with the commission. Yes, Mr. Pacheco. We strongly uh, believe that under Sheriff Marikami's role uh, relative to gangs, exclusionary groups, cliques must be investigated fully and fairly. We strongly believe that the citizens of Los Angeles County deserve complete transparency and accountability regarding uh, Sheriff Deputy Gangs. We believe that under Sheriff Mirakami's testimony can help us shine a bright light onto these challenging issues and give us some opportunity to understand what's happening in the various sheriff stations throughout the county, the facilities, and on the streets in Los Angeles. When given the opportunity to ask questions of the undersheriff, we will seek information regarding the following. The existence of deputy gangs in the department, the scope and impact of deputy gangs on the department, including the department's practices, policies, culture and chain of command. We will look at the scope and impact with the undersheriff of deputy gangs uh, and its effect on the members of the community. We will look at the effectiveness of the department's existing policies in addressing issues with regard to law enforcement gangs and um, seeing if they work at all. We would ask questions whether members of these groups engage in conduct that violates department's policies, law, and best law enforcement practices. 
and we will ask questions of the undersheriff with regard to recommended policies, leadership, and actions needed to address and eradicate this scourge on the county. Thank you. Mr. Dicer, anything else? I mean, I also think we heard testimony today, right? Sworn testimony that undersheriff Murakami has a tattoo. Yes, we did. A caveman tattoo. Yes, we did. We probably will have a question too about that. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And, uh, Mr. Dykes or anything else? Uh, that's all subject to public comment. Okay. Uh, I think the rule is commissioner comments 1st, and then public comment. If the commissioners want to say anything, does anyone. Let's go to public comment. Our 1st speaker is Steve Hill, followed by our last speaker that signed up. Richie Sergenko. Another one. Hello, my name is Steve Hill. I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran, a retired correctional peace officer, business owner, and uh, I'm also a black Satanist. Now, uh, part of the reason I'm here is because of my license plate. I have a vanity state issued license plate that reads for Satan. I know religion is in the news now because of the Supreme Court, but this happened long before. Um, that's just part, part of the reason. The other reason is I've been arrested. I have my guns confiscated. That was on February, uh, uh, no, March 7th. And I do believe it was because I spoke out at a meeting on January 22nd about cannabis and the illegal grows in the Antelope Valley um to this day i don't know why i've been arrested the department of justice assisted in my arrest i i have a letter from them certified telling me not to come to court i have another letter stating that they reject filing charges against me and the sheriff's department is not releasing any information i've talked to all of my elected officials uh, v. Jesse Smith, black pastor up there, they all know about it. Nobody's doing nothing. Senator Scott Wilk did check into it for me and stated that protocol wasn't followed. But I also had a, a previous lawsuit of a rogue deputy coming to my house, tracking me down to investigate me for being in his neighborhood. Now, I'm a real estate appraiser. I'm in everybody's neighborhood. I couldn't even get to court for that before my attorney fired slash quit. Anyway, the, Mr. Bonner, the last meeting, you instructed someone from the panel to get my uh, documents. So today I brought them. Thank you. Um, your time okay, our next, uh, next member. Richie Sergenko, followed by MJ King, followed by Stephanie Luna. Um, yeah. So I'm Richie Serjanko, um, with the group People City Council, um, also with the Check the Sheriff Coalition. Um, I'd urge the commission to do whatever they can to um, enforce the law against Sheriff Villanueva for defying subpoenas over and over again. Um, you know, you can hold him in contempt, you can do something. Um, but the fact that he's, the excuse that he gave was that he is, um, afraid for his safety because people are wearing fuck the sheriff's department shirts in here. Um, it's a r ridiculous excuse considering that there are violent deputy gangs um, that kill community members like Anthony Vargas and the sheriff's department continues to harass day nearly daily the Vargas family. And so when you talk about violence and safety you know, their, their safety is at risk all the time. So for Alex Villanueva to say that he can't come into a room at Loyola Law School because the Vargas family wears fuck the sh sheriff's department jackets, just utterly ridiculous. And just, I, don't, I don't see how that can be a valid excuse to defy a subpoena. And so I would like to know what your plan is to hold him accountable for defying subpoena and to use that ridiculous argument 
especially since we have a First Amendment right to wear clothing that says, fuck the Sheriff's Department. Um, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Followed by Stephanie Luna. Villanueva's Chief of Staff and Gr Grim Reaper member Lauren Snowmessey's testimony was enlightening today. Somebody might. It's too bad that he couldn't oh, recall too yeah. much. Both Del Messi and Burson both claimed they were just doing their jobs. Just doing your jobs is enforce, enforcing the status quo. Even if a deputy wants to do the right thing, it's impossible in this system that they chose to participate in. We all know that Villanueva fearing for his safety at this meeting is a load of shit. The county's most powerful gang leader playing the victim, it's not cute. He's threatened you, the OIG, the Board of Supervisors. We paid $1.5 million alone plus private security to the LA County CEO for this harassment. Are your continual motions for the County Council to expeditiously enforce Villanueva's, Villanueva's subpoena falling on deaf ears? You know their names. The names of all of the community members whose lives were stolen by LASD. You've heard from their families. How many more lives? must be stolen before there's accountability in the sheriff's department. Thank you. Next. First, Stephanie Luna. Ms. Luna. Hi, uh, thank you, you know, first and foremost to the commission for, you know, even holding these hearings because uh, this is something that's long overdue. You know, my nephew was killed, as many of you know, as part of a deputy gang initiation. And, you know, the testimony that we heard today, it's disgusting. We have uh, the chief of staff that was uh, alongside Villanueva that took part in actively covering up the Kennedy Hall incident, speaking like it was, you know, nothing, you know, not that big of a deal. We have another sheriff that gave testimony that, you know, cried on the stand. And it's, it's just, you know, the tears fall short when they're complicit with the murders of our loved ones. They're complicit with the harassment of families. Um, you know, I just hope that the commission's able to do something to get Villanueva to show up and, you know, be held accountable because it doesn't make sense that he's saying my jacket is part of the problem, why he he's not showing up when on Tuesday he was in West Hollywood at a restaurant eating. And just this morning, while this commission is holding this deputy gang hearing, He's holding a hearing on firework safety. And I'm sorry, but I don't think that fireworks are the single biggest threat to LA County right now. It is in fact the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Um, you know, I'm not sure what else to come up here and say. We, we, like I said, I'm hoping that the commission's able to figure out a way to get Villanueva in here because he needs to be held accountable. He's gone after so many of you guys publicly. He's gone after the attorney general. He's gone after the OIG. He's gone after, you know, um, families, public, public uh, speakers, and it's just too much already. Something needs to be done, and we we need to figure out a way to hold Villanueva accountable and eradicate deputy gangs first and foremost, so we can ultimately, you know, abolish the sheriff's department. Thank you. Thank you. So it's um, one o four. I think it is uh, uh, time to adjourn. Mr. Dykstra, I want to thank you and your crew of excellent lawyers for helping us uh, develop uh, all the information about the alleged deputy gangs in the LA Sheriff's Department. The investigation is ongoing. We will hold a fourth special hearing on deputy gangs uh, on a date to be determined near the end of this month. And uh, uh, Mr. Dykstra, I, I guess we'll work with Chief Tardy to make sure that it's a date that works for her so she can conclude her testimony. With that, I think that we are adjourned. Thank you, commissioners, for showing up. Thank you, members of the public, for participating. <laughs>